<laughs> okay, so we've got a great evening <laughs> planned tonight with Lee. So he's generously given up his time to chat about paragliding with us. Um, so hopefully you guys will all enjoy it. It's all focused around SIV, wind control. So if you've got any questions about that, just feel free to ask. We're going to try and make it interactive. So we've got a few little polls that we'll do tonight. Um, Lee's got some questions for you. And if you've got any questions for him, then let's try and make it a, a two-way conversation. So I'll just pass over to Lee now. So over to you, Lee. No. Hello, everybody. I can see a few people I know there. Hello. Uh, first of all, guys, thank you so much for, for joining. I think this is a wonderful thing. And I was just chatting to Andy before uh, about how, how important it is to, to talk properly about SIV and understand the subject. Um, <clears throat> It's going to be a little bit different. There's a couple of things that I'll say that, that I will that I also say to my groups when I first sit down at the table on an SAP course. There's a couple of things that I say to people. One of them is, what does SIV mean to you? When someone mentions those three letters, what's the, the first kind of emotion or the first kind of, of feeling that you have? Now, I want you to think about that and come up with the answer in your mind, but obviously we can't, we can't it's very difficult for everyone individually to be able to answer that. But generally, the, the, the main answer that people give when you talk about SIV is the deflation stuff, you know, uh, uh, creating big incidences, lots of G4 speed, lots of, of deflations, that kind of thing. But for me, it's a lot more. So SIV is about being safe in the air. It's about simulating incidences. It's about keeping ourselves safe. What I like to think of SIV about is a lot more than that. It's, it's a three-stage, paragliding is a, a three-stage thing. We've got to take off. To be able to get in the air, we need to take off. Then we need to be able to, to deal with ourselves in the air in whatever conditions or environment we're flying in. And then after every flight has to come a landing. So I like to break paragliding down into the three stages. Um, and when I think of SIV these days, or the way I like to think about SIVs, the way I like to portray SIVs, is trying to make us Perfect if we can be that, or at least good, safe, and competent at the three stages. So it's not just about deflating our glider. It's not about creating these huge, scary thinking incidences, which everybody thinks of. The moment you mention SIV, everyone thinks of huge deflations, whizzing around in the sky, a lot of scary stuff. And I'm going to show you some videos tonight that look quite scary. What I've done is, is I've picked out the worst of the worst videos from all the courses I've done over the last 11 years. Um, and I'm going to show you those. What you're going to see is examples of how even the scariest of the scariest or the worst of the worst can actually be resolved. But for me, what SIV about it is about is preventing that situation. It's not an, allowing ourselves to be in a, in a situation where we have to deal with that. I'm obsessive about paragliding. What qualifies me to sit in front of you tonight and, and be able to talk to you about this is I'm completely obsessed with paragliding. We were, I was chatting with Andy earlier and I was saying, for, for me, paragliding is more addictive than heroin. It's something I think about every day. It's a huge, it's a, it's a major part of my life. It's what I do for work. It's what I do for a hobby. It's all I can think about. I absolutely love it. But what I want you to remember is I'm the same as you. I'm human and I'm just a pilot. I have the same two strings that you guys have. I have the same materials that you guys have. Um, <clears throat> but what's allowed me to get to the stage that I have, first of all, I've managed to turn my hobby into a profession. So it's something that I do every day, which means I have a lot of, well, I say every day, it's been pouring. I hear you've had quite good weather in Scotland. Well, you have the good weather, we're taking the bad weather. So it's been horrendous this week. But I have a lot of opportunity to go flying, to play with a glider. Um, <clears throat> And there's a few things that we'll talk about tonight to try and get some perspective in where we're at, how we're going to progress, what we need to be able to do to progress, what we need to be able to do to be safe, to be able to manage our expectations and be realistic about how much time we can give to it and what level we can expect to achieve. But what I say to a lot of my guys is SIV is, as I said, about the deflation stuff, but I'm not really interested in that. What I'm looking for in an SIV is how you fly. How do you do the normal things on a glider? How do you make a 360 degree turn? How do you make a 180 degree turn? Because these are the things that we do when we're flying. You know, if we're ridge soaring, we're making 180 degree turns. If we're thermaling, we're doing 360s. How do you do that? 
do you do that well? Can you can you do a nice tight 360 turn, which occasionally, or you know, uh, sometimes you need to be able to climb in a thermal. Thermals can be the size of a football field. Thermals can be the size of a tennis court. There are times we need to turn our glider nice and tight. If we do that, we create energy. Are you able to control the energy of that turn? Are you able to exit your turn really nice and smoothly instead of coming out and pitching and rolling and, you know, uh, yeah, rolling and pitching? Can you deal with that? Can you deal with the energy? Can you keep yourself by, by your general flying safe enough to not have to worry about these incidences that can come up? How confident are you with your piece of kit? How confident are you with the brake range of your glider? What I, what I tend to find is, and it, for me, it's been an issue ever since I started, is it's the easiest form of aviation to get into. And to be able to fly a paraglider in the basic form is quite easy. To be able to master it is incredibly difficult. And the, and the problem is with any other form of aviation, you can jump in a, in a, on a paraglider within two weeks. You can go from zero to here over two weeks, you're given a license and you're cast out on a hill with quite frankly, not that much information. And then you're relying on secondhand information or information from people on the hill. Now, what I love about your club is you have some guys in your club who have genuine good information. You have a really good, uh, a really good club system, but that doesn't always exist. Um, the weather in the UK is difficult. If it's a, a hobby for you, you've got wives, you've got dogs, you've got dogs, you know, you've got to try and fit in when the weather's good, in between painting the fence, going to work. It's never flyable on a Saturday, Sunday. It's only flyable on a Tuesday or, or any day that you might be working, for example. So SIV is, is a lot more about preventing the incidences from happening than it is about dealing with them. Obviously, learning how to deal with them is great. We need to know what to do. We need to know what to do. We also need to know what not to do. Because the problem is when we when we have a lack of knowledge in what the glider's doing, um, that's when we can over input or we can make mistakes. So what I'd like to get across tonight is doing SIV courses is wonderful and I love them and I promote them and I think they're a wonderful thing to do. But we can do a lot by ourselves, by just understanding the mechanics of how a glider moves. The good news is a glider can only move in so many ways. It can go forward, it can go backwards, it can go side to side, it can go a little bit diagonally, but it can only physically move in so many ways. Once we understand what the glider is doing, it becomes a lot easier to deal with. And a lot of the time, there's a lot less we need to do than we think. Having the confidence with the brake range, for example. So if I was to ask you guys, and I ask my guys on the SIV this, if I was to ask you guys to go out now and fly straight and level and pull your brakes down to the carabines. How many of you will be confident to do that? And I can only see, I can't see everybody, but <clears throat> well done, Ruth and Graham, I can see you guys there. You'd be confident to do that? Now, I did see there a couple of heads shaking, possibly, very good. Who's that, who's that in the glasses here, who just went, who just said that? That's me, Mark. Hello, Mark, brilliant, well done. Well done for your honesty as well. One thing you've got to be really clear about, guys, when we're going to talk about the subject of SIV, is to be honest. The more you're honest, the better you'll end up being. Because what tends to happen is when you're in a group of pilots, generally people go, oh, yeah, I can do that, or I'll do that. And sometimes people go, oh, I, I don't want to be the one that goes, well, I'm, I'm a little bit nervous of that, or I'm a... You've got to be completely honest. Because if you're not, and you have a worry about something, you still know you're worried about it. But, you know, you might say in a group, yeah, yeah, I can do that. No problem. Yeah, I'd be confident to do that. But in, if internally you're not confident to do that, you know, it sounds hard, you know you're lying or you, or you know that that's not true. And what you end up finding is you just incorporate this kind of lack of confidence, this lack of information, and people get very nervous or, or afraid of asking questions. You know, they don't want to ask a stupid question or they don't want to, to, to see, you know, to come across as, as being silly, for example. Honesty is the best policy, because if you're honest about where you're at, you can start to, to deal with things. You can start to tackle things. Now, why did you do that? What would be your issue if you're slowing the glider down to the Carabinas, for example? So I know that down to the Carabinas is fine. I'm on a glider I bought fairly recently. I'm not quite sure what happens when I start pulling the brakes harder and harder. Mm -hmm. um, and... 
I'm generally fine if I'm somebody's watching me or I'm being coached, but if I'm out in the wild by myself on a hill, nobody else around, that's when I start feeling like down by the Caribbean as I'm getting into the risk zone. Yeah. And I might be over <laughs> over judging it, but I start feeling a little bit nervous when I'm down there. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. So the first thing I want to say is it doesn't matter what glider you fly. So I'm in the summers, I'm a tandem pilot in Austria. I also, my passion is acro. And my passion for acro came from doing a couple of SIVs for starting to enjoy things I was very terrified of when I was a new pilot, starting to really enjoy that. And starting to realize all acro is, acro can sometimes have a bit of a bad name because it's full of people with white sunglasses and caps and, and you know, very colorful shorts and a bit of ego. For me, what acro is, is extreme wind control. It's just dealing, what we try and do in acro is we try our hardest to stop the wing fly. Our aim is to stop the wing flying in as many different ways as, as possible. Every single glider, if it's in trim, is has the same amount of brake range. So my tandem, my acro glider, my lightweight kit, my normal cross country glider, for them to be certified, they need to have, you know, basically exactly the same reaction. My acro glider, the flare point is the same as on my tandem, is the same as on any other glider that I fly. What we start to find is people are very nervous about using brake range, using brake pressure. It can be really advantageous, not just from a safety point of view, but from an efficiency point of view. So something else that we look at on the SIV, which is, is generally, which a lot of pilots don't think about, is the SIV is also, it's not just about teaching you how to deal with incidents. It's about teaching you how to fly better, how to be better, how to be able to be more efficient. So I've just come back from Colombia uh, and we had two two week tours. And one of the things that we were, or, or that I'm very hot on, is about pilots flying efficiently. So that starts from being able to manage energy, from being confident in doing a nice tight turn and managing the energy as you come out of it. Because if you come out of it with a pitch and a roll, you're losing your efficiency. Not just from a safety angle, but from a cross country point of view, you want to be as efficient and as smooth as possible. Also, if you're ridge soaring, for example, and you're in some really lifty air, if you slow your glider down through that lifty air, you're going to climb a little bit more efficiently. If you're in sinky air, if you speed the glider up, you're gonna get through that sink a little bit more efficiently as well. We have a huge brake range, which isn't just for safety, but it's also about efficiency. It's about maximizing the air mass that, that we're in, about speeding the glider up, slowing the glider down. If I'm in really, really turbulent air, what would your reaction be? So I get into a very, we call it the washing machine, or you're in full combat mode. You're in a piece of air that's really kicking your, your ass around. What's people's reactions? And again, it's very difficult to get you all to answer. But for example, what would your be, reaction be as your center stage? I don't think I've been in air like that. Okay. What do you think you would do? So, you know, air like that can happen at any point. If we're unlucky enough for conditions to change or deteriorate, and suddenly you find you're in an incredibly turbulent air mass, the glider's all over the place, what might your reaction be? Um, I think I would get pretty nervous, and I would try and maintain pressure in the glider um, <clears throat> by pulling whichever control seems to need it the most. <laughs> Already, though, a fantastic answer. Keep pressure in the glider. There's quite a lot of um, talk around. I've heard it from the UK. I hear it here in Spain. Of If in doubt, hands up. Let the glider do its thing. You know, ENAs are incredibly good. EMBs are incredibly good. ENCs are incredibly good. But you can never trust your glider 100%. Your glider has no brain, no personality. I mean, I talk to mine. Mine has a name. I call it Sweetheart. We argue. But it, it has no personality. It's, <clears throat> no glider will look after you 100% of the time. If we are able to slow the glider down all the way down to the Caribbeans, for example, and my cutoff point is always the Caribbeans. I have a green zone, hands up to the Caribbeans. That's my green zone. And people say, well, that's, that's slowing it down quite a lot, Lee, and that's getting close to the store point. So my challenge is the next time you come into a field in, in nil wind, try flaring only down to the Caribbeans. How's your landing going to be? What do you think? 
it depends on the wind. <laughs> that well, say there's no wind. There's absolutely no wind. You're coming in in a new wind field, and I only want you to flare to your Caribbeans. How's that going to work out? <clears throat> I would have thought it'd be okay. It's going to be pretty fast. If you can run, all right, it's going to be pretty fast. Where would you flare to? To where? Where do you flare your glider to? No, further than that. <laughs> yeah. When we come into land, we go from the Caribbean. It's another half of the the way down. So we've got a massive margin of error from uh, from the Caribbean. It's all the way to hands down. And generally, if the glider's in trim, three or four seconds later, the glider will eventually drop back. If we only, if we're regulate, or we're very strict with ourselves about going down to. The see a glider have a deflation there's a lot of drag on one side the other side will whip round the glider will turn the glider will dive the slower we can meet the air the slower or less of the reaction we'll have by slowing the glider down the glider will move back because we can't pivot around the glider the glider can only pivot around us we move the glider back a bit that moves our weight forward the most important part of of uh, the paraglider is to have our weight around the leading edge that's the bit that we want nice and solid. So by putting the brakes on, we squeeze the top and bottom surface together. We increase the internal pressure. So the glider is a little bit more pressurized. The glider is flying slower. And actually in, in a really, really turbulent air mass, we can keep ourselves a lot safer and further away from the opportunity of a deflation, for example. But it's having the confidence. There's a lot in paragliding because we only really have two weeks of training. Um, there's a lot of gaps in the knowledge. And, and a lot of pilots' problems is the gap in the knowledge. Is not quite sure what will happen if I do that, or not quite sure what to do with the consequence of what happens. So <clears throat> another thing I say to people is, you can stand on a hill and you'll watch a pilot who makes it look easy. They do a wonderful takeoff, they fly around, and it looks very graceful. When someone flies a paraglider really well, it looks really graceful. It's lovely to watch. When a pilot makes a really nice landing, it's lovely to watch. And what I encourage pilots to do is to start taking a bit of pride in your flying. Make sure you're, you're conscious of the way you're flying. Are you making turns? Whoop, there's a bit of speed there. Whoop, and I'm getting a little pitch up. Well, I always get a little surge out of my turns and my glide always rocks about a little bit. I introduced a word to myself in my early days of acceptable and unacceptable. And what I would start to say to myself is if I make a turn and I come out with a bit of excess energy and my glider pitches back, pitches forward, I would tell myself that's unacceptable. What we have to remember is paragliding is all about who's watching you on the hill, not about what we do. It's about who's watching you on the hill. It's about making it look pretty. It's about making ourselves do a good job. It's about having confidence in what we're doing. Confidence is absolutely key. How do we get confidence? We need to practice. How much time realistically, guys, are you able to put into your flying? I'm super lucky where I can do it every day that the weather is good, but how much time do you realistically have to put into your, into your flying? For a lot of people, it's very difficult because it's a, it's a hobby and it's very weather dependent. Is there stuff we can do to improve? Absolutely. We can start thinking about it. We can start going out and ground handling. Again, that's a little bit weather dependent, but we can start to go out and ground handle. The first part of paragliding is a launch. If we have a bad launch or if we're going up to launch, I used to be terrible at reverse launching in my early days and I used to dread it. And I'd go up the hill and I would be the last one, I'd be hiding. I, I, I didn't enjoy the reverse launch at all. And um, what I found is I started shying away from it. I would start to try and, my forward launches were okay. I'd start to try and forward launch as much as I could because I was quite nervous of the, of the reverse launch. If we put a little bit of time into it, we can start to get over these little fear barriers. If we can start to make a good launch, we start to be more confident and comfortable. Before we even do that, how many of you are confident and comfortable with your kit? If I was to take all of your kit now, put it onto a table, and I was to grab your reserve handle, pop your reserve out in its back. I'm not talking about getting the whole parachute out. I'm talking about just getting the reserve out and putting it on the table. How many of you would be confident to put it back in your harness? Good. That's really good to see. Well done. 
A lot of people aren't. A lot of people are a little bit, like, we, they don't have the confidence in their own kit. How many of you regularly check your speed bars to make sure that your speed bars are nice and symmetrical, that you have the full range available and that they are not asymmetric? <clears throat> yeah, well done. Again, well done for the honesty. It's something, there is a lot we can do. SIV is a lot more, again, than just the deflation exercises that everyone thinks about. It's about making ourselves as safe as possible right from the start. So being able to put your reserve back in means you would be happy periodically. So for example, in the winter, most UK pilots go into hibernation because the weather doesn't tend to be that good. Three or four, five, six months later, we turn up, we dig our, our kit out and off we go fly. Is everything good? How's your reserve? How, is those, how are those elastic bands that have been sat there in possibly a damp environment or whatever it might be. Elastic bands are great, but they only last for a certain amount of time. How are your carabiners? They all done up nice and tight. How are your shoulder mounts? They all done up nice and tight. You've got to check these kind of things. So a lot of pilots turn up, they're not particularly confident with their own kit. They, and, and I agree, if you're not confident to do it yourself, you send it off to, uh, to somewhere. Or, uh, so there are companies around the UK, around the world, who will do it for you. So you will send your reserve off to be repacked, or maybe you'll send the reserve off in the harness to be repacked. Someone else is doing it for you. A professional, a, a person who claims to be a professional who will sort it out for you. I do kit inspections on every course I do. I used to only do it on the SIV. I found so many incidences that I now do it on every course that I do. In Colombia this year, I had 11 pilots on my first week, 11 pilots on my second week. I had two reserve systems that were completely non-functional. They wouldn't have worked. We have to take responsibility for ourselves. We cannot rely on, on anybody else. We have to be able to rely on ourselves. Now, I'm not talking about packing the parachute. That is something a bit different. Generally, doesn't really matter as long as the lines are okay, how the parachute is packed, it will open. But what does matter is, is it connected? I have had reserve systems where the two bridle ends, the bridle from the reserve to the bridle from the harness has not been connected. I've had shoulder mounts that haven't been connected. I've had reserves that people have had in their kit for two years. And when you take them out, all the elastic bands are perished. So as soon as you pull the reserve out, the bag falls apart, the reserve's gonna end up in your face. I've had so many incidences of speed bars, their lines, humidity, heat, cold, whatever, can make a difference. I've had speed bars that are really asymmetrical. An asymmetrical speed bar is quite a dangerous thing to have because it brings the glider halfway forward, you know, for technical reasons that, that I won't bother going into too much, but having an asymmetric speed bar is not a great thing to have. Having a speed bar where you put your feet out and you've only got a quarter of the range is not a great position to be in. Speed bars are great for transitions, possibly on cross-country flights, but what speed bars are great for is if you get caught in de deteriorating conditions, in wind speeds that they're picking up, you need to have that extra five, six, seven mile an hour of speed to help you push forward. If you don't keep an eye on your kit, these are the kind of things that can catch pilots out. Honestly, guys, these are the things that cause incidences much more than deflations. I have a daughter, I have a wife, and I'm obsessed with paragliding. But if I genuinely thought that every time I go flying, my glider was going to fold itself away uh, or give me a big cravatted spiral, a horrible problem, I wouldn't do it. As much as I love it, I wouldn't do it. Those kind of things don't happen so much. What does happen is reserve systems not working in the very unlikely event you need to use it. Speed bars being asymmetrical, speed bars not being available at their full range. This is most of, if you look at a lot of the accident statistics, these are the kind of things that crop up. These are the kind of things that we can sort. You guys can sort it tonight. You guys can sit in your harness, push your speed bar on and go, oh, brilliant. The two pulleys come together. Great. Or, oh, cracky, I've got one that comes together, one that only comes halfway down. Asymmetrical speed bar. You can make a change tonight that suddenly makes you a whole lot safer. You, if you're happy to put it back in your bag, you can pull your reserve out tonight. You can make sure those carabiners are done up. You can make sure all the elastic bands that are holding the bag together is done up. And you can make sure that it works perfectly in and out of your harness. You've just made yourself a safer pilot already. You can start to take um, interest in how you fly. How do I turn? Do I turn nice and smoothly? Do I turn nice and efficiently? Do I manage to bleed the energy out of my turn so I don't have a lot of pitching and rolling? you can start to make yourself safer like that. The more the glider pitch and pitches and rolls around, 
the more your, your weight underneath it is moving, the more you're changing the weight distribution on your glider in really turbulent or, or thermic air, not turbulent air, but thermic air, that can have a, an effect on how the glider responds. There's a lot we can do before we ever get to that point of dealing with deflations, for example. If you're really confident with your brake range, so when you're flying on a ridge, it doesn't matter if you have an ENA, EMB, ENC, END, comp glider, a lift band will be so high. An ENA can get as high as, a, as an ENZO3, as high as an EMB, as high as a D, doesn't matter. It's how you fly. It's how efficient you are. If you can slow your glider down with confidence, if you can speed it up, if you're, if you're allowing yourself to use the full brake range, you can be a lot more efficient. If you start to think about the doubts and the questions that you have, and you start to tackle them, and, and what SIB is really good for is we can answer some of the doubts that you have. Fear, generally, fear is of the unknown. So the more we can answer the, the questions we have, the less fearful we are, and the more confident we are. It's a, it's a completely made up statistic, but 97.83% of paragliding is all up here. It's how we feel on the day. It's how psych psychologically we feel. Are we confident? The more confident you are, the more you commit to it. The less confident you are, the more doubts and fears you have, the more difficult the process is, the more we, we're constantly battling with, with our, our mindset. So there's a lot we can do before we get to, to that situation. Just by understanding that our brake range that we have usable is a lot more than people think. But then what happens? What happens then if we do have an incident? When will an incident be? What would cause an incident? And again, it's very difficult in a scenario like this to get everybody to answer. But a, a common question I, I ask people is, first of all, what kind of flying do you like to do? Because there, there is a multitude of different options you have. I really enjoy going down to a site in West Wales called Rasili. And on a summer's evening in super smooth laminar air, it's one of the most beautiful experiences. The sun is going down, you're flying along the beach. I will happily clip my brakes on, take my phone camera out. I will lean, I will weight shift myself around because I'm not worried about anything happening because the air is super smooth. If I take off on the mountain here in Algodonal, it's very early in the morning where the air is super smooth, where the sun hasn't had a chance to heat. I don't really have to worry about anything at all. So starting to understand about when these kind of situations can arise, what kind of situations can cause these situations to arrive, arise, and what flying do I really like to do? I really enjoy some ridge soaring. I really enjoy some boating around on the coast. I really enjoy cross country. I really enjoy acrobatic paragliding. And I adjust my mindset and my thought process and how I fly my glider. There are times in cross country flights, I would never release my brakes. I am never gonna take my hands off the brakes to start taking photos. But there are lovely times here in the morning when I'll make a flight down and I'll take a few photos. I'm not worried about my glider having a problem because I understand that the, the conditions that I'm flying in are safe conditions. So it's just starting to think about when we need to switch on, when we can relax a little bit. But again, it's having the knowledge. It's thinking about it. How many of you on the poll, there were, and again, it's a very difficult one to answer, but there were quite a few people who said they had incidences that they didn't, they didn't know what happened. And that's a very common thing. And what tends to happen, and the majority of incidences are, Graham, you've got your hand up there. Can I just clarify, I've had incidences that I didn't know what happened at the time, but I worked it out afterwards. Hmm. And that's... Um... <laughs> Yeah, and if you're around afterwards to be able to work it out, it's a very good thing. <laughs> yeah, exactly so. What happens in a lot of what I deal with, you know, I, I have um, <clears throat> some private one-to-one -one courses that I do with people to recover from incidences. I look at their videos. What I can tell you mostly is, and again, it's a made-up statistic, but 99% of incidences that happen are mostly caused by either an overreaction from the pilot or no reaction from the pilot. Most incidences are very simple to deal with. If we understand them, we do the right thing at the right time. What tends to happen if something starts happening with the glider is a lot of pilots go into panic mode. And when we go into panic mode, we get the adrenaline. And I have seen so many videos where you see the, the people doing this on the brakes, flapping up, down, up, down, because they're not really sure what to do. Do I let it go? Do I break it? Do I let it go? Do I break it? And I, I see that kind of thing all the time. And it's most, of the time, and I say this on the SIV a lot, <clears throat> it's not the first incident that gets you, it's the second. 
it's an incredibly complicated situation talking about SIV, if you want to make it that way. If you do want SIV, does that make you a safe pilot for the rest of your life? Generally not. Your first SIV is just to experience it, just to kind of get used to what it is, to experience a little bit of a bit more adrenaline, a bit more speed, a bit more G-force to realize how good the glider is. <clears throat> if you just do one, it's not a tick box where you go, I've done an SIV, that's me for the next 10 years. I don't know how many of you have taken the pilot exam. It's quite a tri tricky one. I mean, you've all taken exams during your life. Now, think of the last time you took an exam, you swatted and you did your exam. Now, if I put that exam paper in front of you now, how well do you think you do? You'd have to swat up, right? You'd have to swat up. It's the same. One SIV makes you a safe pilot for six weeks, eight weeks, couple of months, six months, maybe a year, depending on how much you're going to think about it afterwards. But the very simple thing that we can do, the one thing that can keep you very, very safe is if you're not sure what's going on, that there is the, the mantra of hands up. Bruce Goldsmith, that I did a podcast with last year, was very encouraging of, if you're not sure what's going on, hands up. Gliders are designed to recover by themselves. So if we interfere with the brakes, we interfere with the recovery of the glider, and we start to increase the, the potential of the glider misreacting or having very big surges forward. So in the initial incident, the hands up policy, I do, I do agree with. However, it's not hands up, sit back, wait for the drinks trolley, select the movie. It's hands up for that incident. That gives us time to prepare for the recovery, which is generally a surge or a dive forward. And the one thing, even if you never contemplate or do an SIV from this moment on, the one thing I would love you guys to take away this evening is if you're not sure what's happening, you're not sure what to do, there's a couple of things we need to look out for. We have a deflation, great. As I will show you in videos in a couple of seconds, the glider will have a natural reaction where one side will slow down, create drag, the outer wing tip will dive forward. We need to be aware of catching dives. So anytime a glider slows down or a glider is stopped from flying, it will reinflate, it will regain its air speed by diving forward. If we break that dive, we immediately stop the second incident. I saw it, and Graham, and, and probably you, Andy, I don't know if, if you guys were aware, there were a lot of reserve pools in Colombia this year. A lot of it was from, from pilots chugging around on full bar. They've been to Colombia a few times. This year was a fantastic year, but it was very dry. The air was quite turbulent. For three or four of the people that have spoken to me about the reserve pools that happened in, um, in Colombia this year, every single one, all four of them that I've seen so far, were not the first incident. It was a lack of reaction to the second incident where the glider dived forward, the pilot did nothing about it. Then, I mean, you guys tell me, what happens if you let your glider dive too far forward? Brilliant. It collapse. Exactly, right? So how can you stop that? What would you do? What can you do? Break the dive. Break the dive. Okay, a very simple term, break the dive. Stop it going too far forward, brilliant. Now then, how much brake can you use? How confident are you on how much brake you can use to stop the dive? Because again, pilots, when you have an incident, it's scary. If you're not expecting it, you have a big 70% deflation, oh my God, that's quite um, disappointing in itself. Then the thing reinflates, then the thing bucks forward. And at this point you've had this, now the glider's coming forward. It's very easy to freeze, to sit there, do nothing. Or to be worried about how much brake you can pull. If you're worried about bringing your brakes down to the Caribbean as in a normal situation, how are you gonna feel about bringing your brakes down in a dive forward situation? Take them all the way down. And then when the glider <laughs> stop, lift up, let them off again. Fantastic. You cannot stall a glider that is traveling forward. So if a glider has momentum, if it's coming forward, maybe you need a little bit of brake. Maybe you need quite a bit of brake. Maybe you go all the way down to here. The most important thing is you stop that dive. The moment you've done that, congratulations, mission accomplished. We put our hands back up, the glider recovers. That one piece of information can be the difference to many pilots in terms of safety in terms of being confident enough to pull enough brake to stop it, not being afraid. Well, if I go down here, maybe I'll stall it. If a glider's traveling forward, there's no chance of us doing that. If we were to hold the brakes there after the glider had finished its travel forward, 
and we were to sit there with our hands all the way back, obviously then we're not letting the glider recover. But if we were to break it, we catch the dive, we fly away. Nine times out of 10, you've prevented the secondary incident from occurring. The other one, the other major one is a cravat situation. What's a cravat? I'm letting you, we're obviously, oh, very good. I can see some hand things going on there, Ruth and Greg. Very good, exactly. A cravat is a situation where you have the wingtip that's come in, the glider is reinflated quickly, it hasn't allowed the, the wingtip to come out, it catches. This is the most dangerous situation and this is the main reason for reserve pools. And I'm gonna stop bleating at you for a moment and I will start to, to show you some videos. But I just want to get these points across so that when you watch the videos, you can start relating this information to what you're seeing. The dangers of cravats are, what will it do? Will the glider continue to fly straight? What, what will a cravat situation do? Absolutely. It's gonna to start to pull you around into an unwanted turn. What can we do about that? Because it gets thoroughly unpleasant if we sit there and, and let it go. If, if we become, a, and, and another term that I want you to think about is be a pilot, not a passenger. OK, but you need the confidence to do that. You need to know what you're doing is the correct thing to do. If your glider has a cravat and it starts to pull you around to one side, what will you do about it? What, what can you do? What are you going to do? Weight shift. Weight shift and brake. How much brake? As much as it needs. Fantastic. But if you're already a bit nervous about pulling your brake down to the carabiner, when the thing starts going, that's a scary moment. The glider's taking control of you. And it's a horrible feeling and experience for the glider to start taking control of you. We're in a panic situation already because it's a very unpleasant experience. Now we're starting to hope we don't mess it up or how far can I pull it? You stop it from turning. If we recognize the situation and we stop it early, it's a complete non-event. Even if it starts to get a lot more powerful. If we have the confidence to get over and to pull the brake, we can stop it. Again, it's just having a little bit of confidence in the basic control that we have on a glider, not being afraid of the brake range that we have, not being afraid to take part, but, but that means we have to have some kind of understanding. And this is what SIB courses are really good for. It's about teaching you the prevention. It's about making you a much more efficient pilot. I like my pilots who finish my SIV to go back to their respective flying environments and look good, do a nice launch, do a really nice turn, be really taking pride in their flying to complete every turn smoothly to be able to manage your energy. We do a lot of turn reversal and I am a taskmaster for that. And every single time you fly out, before we start the general maneuvers, we will do a lot of turn reversals. What they are is a 360 degree turn in one way, an immediate 360 degree turn the other way. So like a, a big figure of eight, not a turn where we stop, it's a turn where we turn. And as the glider is rolling straight, we continue the roll to go back the other way. Now, to be able to do that safely, you've got to be able to finish your turn, bleed out the energy so the glider is rolling straight above your head into the turn. If we come out of that with a glider with a massive pitch angle, is that a great time to be leaning and pulling the other way to try and force it round? No. A lot of pilots, not a lot, but in my experience, incidences will come from pilots in a thermal trying to bully the glider around. So there are thermals that are strong enough to hold your wingtip up. And you will keep braking, you go down to the carabiners, the, the thing still won't turn, bloody hell, come on. So you lean a bit more, you pull a bit more, you go past the carabiners, you start pulling right down to get the thing to turn. It's not a great idea, because we, we have this cutoff zone of the carabiners. We need to wait, we need to fly through that core, we need to wait until we come out the other side, because we have a very safe brake range we can use that is perfectly adequate, but occasionally, maybe the air is very strong. Maybe we can't get it. Maybe the glider is pitching back because we've done quite a sloppy 360 degree turn. We've come out with a lot of energy. Times that by two because we've got the air rising. The glider is pitching back quite a lot. And pilots are trying to force the glider around. They end up spinning it. Well, that wasn't the glider's fault. That's the pilot not really being aware of, of the mechanics of, of what can happen, being aware of when or not the right time to turn or use a glider is. It's a very simple thing to do. Wait for the glider to come forward, stabilize it, then enter our turn. But there are a lot of pilots out there that just aren't quite aware of the consequences or the movements and the implications of where the glider is. So with some very basic, simple stuff, we can keep ourselves a lot safer. 
you know, makes sense. It's a lot more than just the deflation stuff. It's a lot about prevention. It's a lot about understanding the very little basic stuff. How many of you go out on the hill to ground handle? So when you go ground handling, what type of ground handling do you do? And this sounds really stupid because you've only got two options. You've got a forward launch, you've got a reverse launch. Now I bet none of you are going to forward launch in Scotland because it'll end up being a top to bottom. You need wind on your hill. However, I mean, I don't. I know two of you that I can see, Andy and Graham. You've been to Columbia this year. If your pilots are prepared to travel, you need to have as many tools in your box as you can. And that means a forward launch and a reverse launch. Because there are times, maybe, a forward in Columbia, quite often, we don't get much wind. So pilots will go out and they'll sit on their glider bag going, you know, I've given up a Tuesday afternoon. You know, I could be at home with the wife, but I'm here. I came to Grand Andal. What's the matter with practicing a couple of forward launches? More bloody hell, I haven't done a forward launch since my EP course. Forward launching, great skill to have. Great confidence to have. You're bringing the glider up. You're controlling the, the pitch angle because if it comes over your head too far forward, it's going to collapse, going to fail your launch. Try and give yourself as many tools in your box as you can. It's not just about reverse launching. It's also about having confidence with forward launching. There's that word again, confidence. Have confidence in everything you possibly can. Because if you have confidence in your reverse launch and your forward launch, you're going to be a lot happier when you take off. Instead of having a forward launch situation where your hands are shaking and, oh, my God, you have a bit of a dodgy launch. When you take off, you're not filled with the joys of spring and, and the confidence. You're filled with, oh, God, that was terrible. It all gets into the mindset. Remember that made up statistic, 97 point whatever percent it was. It's about this. There are a lot of things you can do to improve your confidence before you ever need to think about how to deal with an extreme situation. It's about turning up on the hill and going, right, no wind. Took in a couple of forward launches. And once you get them, it's a nice thing to do. I feel confident with that. I can reverse launch in any situation. I can forward launch in any situation. I've got that down. My speed bar is exactly pulley to pulley. And I pulled my reserve out. My elastic bands are good. It's attached. I'm in control. If your EasyJet pilot, Ryanair pilot, got on your flight to wherever you're going and said, yeah, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I, I believe the tires are okay. Uh, I'm pretty sure there's an engine under the left wing. Um, and I, he wouldn't fill you with much confidence, would it? You're the captain of your own aircraft. And we can do a lot to get our confidence, to start dispelling some of these fear things again before we ever get up to the, to the more extreme stuff. Have I made that point clear? I think I've been bleating on for long enough. Should we, get to, should we get to some interesting stuff? Let's have a look at some of the horror shows, shall we? So I believe someone, I have a screen capture. Uh, first thing I'll show you, go oh, have a look at that. Oh, that's awesome. So my recommendation, if you have a lot of sand or grit in your wing, we have a device where you can bring your wing down to you in the harness and you can shake out the sand. How does that make you feel? Looking at that, how does that make you feel? Okay, it looks terrifying to me. If someone told me my glider was going to do that, I'm not sure I'd continue. An extreme... Uh, an extreme picture. There is, let's have a look, there's more than 50% of the glider that's gone missing. Um... Problem? No problem. And again, on SIV courses, we actually give you a lot of problems in a more dramatic way than you're likely to get in a real life situation, especially if you're flying with a bit of brake pressure. So what you what you go through on an SIV course is, is most of the time more than you'll have to deal with in a real life situation. What I used to do is I used to post these pictures up and go, hey, another happy client on, a, on an SIV course. Most people looked at this and went, excuse my language, like forget that, like, forget that. There's no way do I want to go and, and turn my glider into that. That freeze frame is a, is a 0.5 of a second of what really happens. That thing deflates, it reinflates, it flies away. But doesn't that look quite scary? Isn't it better to be in a situation where you learn that it's not as scary as you think it might be, that the glider recovers very well? Imagine now in this situation, if you start yanking on the opposite brake really, really hard when you've only got that amount of flying uh, of glider flying. You can imagine there may be a secondary incident from that. And you may start to cause yourself more problems by not knowing the recovery thing to do or not knowing how to deal with it. Uh, I don't know. Stop sharing. Uh, one second. Back to sharing. What I'd like to show you is a, is a sequence of... Uh, oh, gosh. Uh-oh. My technical in inability is catching me out now. Uh, where are we? Here we go. Uh, deflation sequence. So 
just to give you an idea of, and, and what you'll find as well with SI, with SIV, or gliders in general. Do you remember I said that gliders will only move so many ways? Mechanically, it's only physically possible for them to move in so many ways. So if we start to realize what our glider is doing, it becomes very easy to, to deal with. So we'll get away to the next time. So I asked my pilots to clip the brake on because I don't want the brake to interfere. I asked them to clip the brake on. And again, if you're going to get caught out in this situation, it will be that time in thermic air where you start rummaging around for that mythical Mars bar or to have a little scratch of your bum or to look into your cockpit for something. So we get them to clip the brake on. Do nothing. We're asking the pilot to completely deflate at least 50% of the glider and do nothing. Look quite dramatic. The pilot did nothing. No speed bar. <clears throat> okay. The pilot did nothing. What do you notice? Have a look at it. I mean, that looks quite impressive. Imagine if that happened in a real life situation. Again, if that happens in a real life situation, look how quickly the glider recovers. What's the glider angle there? What's it doing? It's forward of the pilot. It's diving. Okay. What we're looking to do in that situation is we're looking to break the dive. If we start to break the die, because at the moment, can you see how the other wingtip starts to come in? The glider's coming forward. The pressure is releasing from the line. We start to get the other wingtip coming in. What I'll show you in a moment is a real life situation where this event occurred with the pilot and the actual deflation itself was a non-event. The opposite wingtip coming in created an issue and it could have all been prevented by breaking the die. All we need to do in this situation, first of all, is break the die. If we break, and we squeeze the material of the glider top and bottom together, we increase the internal pressure, that's going to help to stop any of this happening, okay? What else are we gonna look for? How are my wingtips? They've recovered, no cravat. If we look at our wingtips and we see that they're caught in, we see we have a cravat situation, we can deal with it very easily without it getting out of control or without it doing anything serious. A couple of things we need to look out for. Okay, so one more time. It's the same every time. It deflates, it turns, it dies, it recovers. We check our wingtips and we break the dive. It deflates, it turns, it dies, it recovers. We check our wingtips, everything's good. No major reaction from air. What we would do in a real life situation. <laughs> we would want to break the dive. Make sense? And you'll find with, I mean, that was quite a big deflation. The reaction, and what we do on, on the SIVs is we do a lot of repetitiveness, which is why I like all of the NIS, because we have a lot of height to be able to talk to you all the way down. So we'll do it again, and we'll do it again, and we'll do it again. And you start to notice the reaction is the same every time. Now, that's all good. The wingtips came out, the wingtips recovered. Wonderful situation. The Dangerous part can come when the wingtip doesn't recover, when the wingtip catches in, which we call a cravat. So the next example over here is a cravat situation, autorotation. Autorotations are the ones generally that will result in either a reserve deployment or it's necessary to have a proper pilot input because the glider will, I mean, it's called an autorotation because the glider will be pulled around into a turn where it will just continue because that wingtip will continue to pull the glider around. It's the biggest uh, reason for reserve deployments. However, it can be stopped, it can be dealt with if we understand it and we have the knowledge to be able to deal with it. So what this exercise is with this guy, we're asking him to pull in a deflation and hold it in. So what we're trying to simulate is a cravat situation where the glider isn't recovering by itself. The more we hold it in, the more drag there is on the inner wingtip, the, the faster the active wingtip will come round, and we get this kind of scenario they call an auto-rotation.
nothing's happening. Occasionally, we have to formulate a few tricks to get the gliders to go. Again, gliders are generally very well behaved, but we can never trust them 100%. So in this exercise, the pilot is leaning and leaning and leaning and leaning and leaning. Half the glider's missing, but the glider's still flying. Okay? No massive reaction we need to do. If that was our, our real-life situation, we need to keep it straight on a straight and safe course. And then we can deal with the incident, which I'll talk about later. But at the moment, he's leaning as hard as he can. It's very difficult to get the glider to go. So we start again. Bosh, deflation exercise. Normally, if it didn't cravat, the glider would deflate, would turn, we'd break the dive, we'd fly away. The simulation here is that it doesn't do that and it begins to turn. Now, have a look at the pilot's position. Suddenly from flying forwards, we end up in a situation where the pilot is now almost flying backwards. Very, very disorientating very scary. I don't know how many of you have experienced G-Force and Speed. It's something that I, I really enjoy, but it was something that was very scary at the beginning. And it's something that can really induce a pilot in the headlights kind of, or a rabbit in the headlights scenario. The moment we start to feel a bit of G-Force and Speed, then we really feel out of control. We were having a lovely day. All we wanted to do was go flying, do a little cross country, have some fun with our friends, and all of a sudden, our glider has done something we weren't expecting. It's now putting us into a situation where the pilot in this scenario is actually flying backwards. I feel a lot of G-force. I feel a lot of speed. It's very difficult to have a rational um, reaction to that if we don't understand what is going on. So the benefit of doing this during an SIV course, although it seems like a scary situation to be in, isn't it better to be in this situation under a supervised and controlled environment where we learn to deal with it than it cropping up at some point during our flying career when we were least expecting it? And now we're dealing with a lot of different things and we don't have much time. We've got to do something. Come on, come on, we've got to do something. Now we've got G-Force and Speed. Now I feel like I'm going backwards. Now my wingtips got... There's a lot to think about in a short space of time. <clears throat> what we got in this scenario, as we can see here, is we had a cravat situation. This is the classic. The line goes around the wing. This will now continue to go. If this pilot doesn't do anything about it, that glider is going to continue until when? When will it stop? Until it hits the ground. Until it hits the ground or until you, you use a reserve parachute system. Okay? Or... Here it goes. Around it goes. It's in this auto rotation scenario. Opposite break, opposite break. How much opposite break? Because if we generate energy, okay, that we need to stop, how much opposite break do you use? Is there a consequence if you build energy? So I don't know how many of you are experienced in spiral dives. Again, going up on a paraglider is quite easy, but there are times we need to come down. And what holds a lot of pilots back is the fear of not having a, a, a bunch of tools in your toolbox to be able to deal with situations. Going cross country, lots of pilots want to do 100K, fantastic. You're going to need to deal with some rough air, so you're gonna to need to be positive and, and, and active and confident with your brake pressure. You're gonna to need to climb up to cloud base. Sometimes when you get to cloud base, it can be quite strong and it can start to suck you a little bit. How are we gonna deal with that? Our basic tools are our big is, our big is in speed bar. They are the bits that we're taught during our CP course, and they are the bits that most pilots have. How many of you are confident? And again, I can't see this. I would love to have you in front of me, but answer this to yourself. How many of you are honestly really confident and comfortable with using your big ears and your speed bar? Because a lot of pilots I have out did their big ears exercise on their CP course, haven't done it for ages, and are suddenly a little bit nervous. When I asked them to do it here on a simple flight, so if we go up in the morning, there's not a lot of wind. We're waiting for conditions to improve. Or at the end of the day, we'll fly down. Rather than just make it a top to bottom, let's do some tasks. Okay, buddy, what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to show me a good set of big ears. 
haven't done that for a while, babe. Can I just check? Is it this line? If you're having to ask that on the takeoff, what are you going to be like when you're under a cloud? How confident are you going to be to be able to climb up, to be under the clouds, to be able to deal with situations if you're not confident in your basic set of maneuvers? And bigger than speed bar is great, but it doesn't really cut it. If you really want to push on in cross country, if you want to start flying in the bigger boy conditions, which, which you need to be able to do good cross country, you've got to have a good set of skills behind you. You've got to be able to deal with some energy. Okay, so the glider goes round, fantastic. What this guy did is a fantastic job of controlling his energy. There is a lot of energy now. It doesn't look so much on the screen, but he's got a little, lot of G-force and speed going on. What he does is a fantastic job, not only of sorting this out, but not creating a secondary incident. Beautiful. If you pull too much brake in that incident, or you, you're starting to, to practice a spiral dive, you're not really sure of, your mate on the hill said, well, just pull a load of brake, it'll happen. It does. If you lean and you pull down to the carabiners and hold it there, eventually your glider will start to turn more inefficiently. What do you do with that energy? So the problem again is when we when we create some energy or some g-force and we're dealing with a cravat and we panic and we start to put a lot of uh, opposite energy in, it can have disastrous effects if we're not aware of the consequences. So we'll go and move on to something a little bit more entertaining if you're happy to. And then maybe we'll have a little break where you guys can, can pitch in. This is the result of um, mismanagement of excess energy. And it, again, it's a great example of what can be recovered and the importance of having the confidence and staying with it, being a pilot, not a passenger. And this is an ENA, because don't forget, everyone on the hill will tell you, you don't have to worry. Guys, don't worry, you're on, a, you're on a buzz. It will look after you. Fantastic. Have a look. A mismanagement of energy. We're learning spiral dives. The guy was quite a big pilot, top of the weight range, yeah, got a little bit freaked out and put a lot of opposite energy to stop the spiral. Lovely. I recover. <laughs> You've got to think about what to do with that energy. <laughs> Secondary incident. Did the spiral cause that? No. That was a mismanagement of the energy from the spiral. That was uh, over. That was a pilot panicking, trying to stop the turn, putting lots of excess energy into the other side. All that energy is going to go somewhere. Now we've got a secondary incident, and it's a messy one. <clears throat> now imagine being like that overland on your. You were just going on a holiday with your friends to have a bit of fun and do a bit of cross country flying, and all of a sudden we end up looking like that. What a terrifying situation that is. Can it be resolved? Should we ever give up? Is there a point? Well, obviously, there's a point where we would like to use our emergency system, which I will talk about later. But a lot can be recovered if we remain a pilot, not a passenger. Opposite weight shift and brake hard. We need to take part. We need to stop, not a little bit down to our shoulders because we're a bit nervous of the carabiners. We need to stop this turn from happening. Full auto rotation situation. Okay. Get your hand over and slow it down. He didn't have the strength at that point to be able to slow it down sufficiently. It's, the brake on the inside isn't doing anything. He got his opposite hand, brought it over, and used that to slow it down. Again, this is, a, this is the worst of the worst. I've picked out the worst of the worst that I've ever had. Okay, this isn't a normal situation. It's the worst of the worst, but it's a great example. Yeah. Of how it can be recovered. Terrifying situation, a situation I never want to be in, but a situation where the pilot didn't freeze, took control, tried to slow it down, took his hand on the other side and properly managed to sort it out. And he's now flying again. He's managed to recover the incident. A terrifying example and nothing I would want you to worry about, but it's a great example of with a little bit of understanding and composure, how things can be rectified. Whew. Up to this point, 
would anyone else like to take part instead of my uh, my voice? Anything, any questions at this point? <clears throat> I think we had a raised hand earlier from uh, Warwick. Have you got a question, Warwick? Yeah, <laughs> hi, Lee. Yeah. Um, could you just give a definition of what an autorotation is? I mean, I, I've heard different um, definitions over the years and some people seem to say that it's, you know, as if you're in this kind of sat situation, almost yes. as we saw earlier. So we call it a poor man's sat. Did you see the example earlier where the pilot was flying backwards? Yes. So it's, and, and where the sat came from uh, with Raul Rodriguez was from seeing alter rotation situations. And then he kind of looked to figure out how you can do that with the glider fully inflated. So we call it the poor man's sat. And, and it is exactly a sat. Um, but with with the cravat, with the glider making it happen instead of the pilot. The so, example is sorry, the glider will collapse. Can I just sorry. sorry? Can I just just clarify? The, if if the if you're cravatted and you're pulled into a extremely severe three hundred and sixty, that wouldn't be defined as an auto rotation. Then uh, it will be the beginnings of it. Okay. So what will happen is your glider will collapse. Uh, and it happens a lot with, with some of the modern gliders with less line sets. What tends to happen is they have explosive openings. So the glider will open very quickly and the wingtip doesn't have a chance to clear the lines. What that can do is it can bite the wingtip. And then you've got the situation where the air is going through the cross port venting, trying to recover the glider, but the glider can't. The wingtip is caught into the lines. What that does then is it pulls quite a big input on the glider. The glider will start to turn. If we allow it to, it will go through 90 degrees, 180 degrees. By the time we go past 180 degrees, the fact that we've got so much pull on the inside will increase the speed of the outer wingtip. The outer wingtip will start to increase in speed, dive round. And eventually, if we let it go 360 to uh, whatever, my math isn't very good, but 360 and a half or two sets of 360, what will eventually happen is the outer wingtip will overtake the inner wingtip and it establishes its position. So we've had our cravat. The glide is pulling us round. The outer wingtip will accelerate until it gets to its stable, what we call a stable position, which is the full auto rotation. And in that situation, then it stabilizes and it will just continue to go. So the importance is to catch it early, is to recognize the wingtip being in, is to recognize the cravat, is to recognize that the glider is pulling us and to react early. If we can catch it by 90, 180, or even 360 degrees, it's actually very easy to stop. And then we can fly the glider nice and straight onto a safe course before we can then correct it. So we managed to do that, guys. Brilliant. The glider was cravatted. It started to pull us around. We remembered that we had this chat and we got onto the outside brake. We stopped the turn before it had much energy and we got it straight. But we still got a cravat. How are we going to deal with that? How do you guys deal with cravats? Because there is a lot of talk around, I would stall it out. So many pilots, yeah, I would just, I would just stall it out. It's a, it's a big misconception that doing doing one or two stalls on an SIV is not eight months down the line going to give you the skills to stall it out. And also when you have a cravat situation, burying brake break symmetrically is going to get you asymmetrically into the stall and most likely a riser twist. That, unless you really know what you're doing, hello, Graham, is a, is a misnomer. Tell me what you're going to do, Graham. Um, well, I would try and pump it out to start with. Um, with the brake? Would, if you've got a, a cravat, break. Probably I would pull the stabilo down as far as I could and see if that helped. How would you do that? Because this is it, guys. So pumping it out may help. But remember, you've got something that's already pulling you into a turn. If you've got just a glider that is sagging, so it hasn't quite reinflated, your wingtip is kind of dangling around, we can pump that out. If you've got a wingtip that is caught in the line, okay, we have a stabilo line for, for that reason. Most important thing first is to what? Is to Keep get the glider. Most correct. Exactly. Well done. The most important thing is keep it on a straight course. Then we're going to get hold of the Stabilo line. Now, does everyone within two seconds of thinking about this know where their Stabilo line is? Yeah. Yeah. Good. If you don't, have a look. On modern gliders, the Stabilo quite often now can be on the sea riser. It's a really simple, basic thing that can really help you out in this situation. But the first thing you need before you can deal with the auto rotation is to know where your Stabilo line is. It's generally a different color the one that goes to the very outer wingtip. Many pilots don't know where it is. So they've heard of it. They're in auto rotation situation. 
Maybe they've managed to straighten up. Now they're hunting around looking for their stabilo line. Know where your stabilo line is. You're unlikely to ever need it, but have that tool in your box. If it ever comes along, because crevasse can happen going off launch with a twig in your line or a pressure or whatever it might be. Go on, Greg. Um, I was going to, I don't know if you, you want to take questions now, but I was going to ask you a question because there's been a lot of introduction of the C category two liner gliders. And I was going, going to ask you what sort of problems that presents you with in terms of, you know, the, uh, the sort of learning process about how they react to an auto well, rotation. Or, yeah. Good question. Before we go to that, I just want to finish okay. on the stability line <clears throat> because I want to make sure you guys know how to use it. How are you going to use a stabilo line? What are you going to do? You've got a big cravat. You've managed to keep it straight. Congratulations. That's good. Yeah. It's, we're not ringing the dinner bell. We need to have the combat. But again, if you don't know how to do it or you don't know if it's because you're worried, I don't want to make it worse. I'm already in quite a scary situation. I don't want to make it any worse. So pilots will grab the stabilo. They'll give it a little ding, 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 ding. We'll give it a pull, but you've got to give it a pull. In my mind, if the glider starts taking control of me and it starts pulling me, I want to fight for control back. So if it's got a cravat and it's pulling me, well, I want to keep it straight. I'm going to get hold of my stabilo line and I'm going to give it a bosh. So I give it two really big, I grab hold of it. And generally with a cravat, you'll find the stabilo will have a little bow in it. I will grab hold of that and I will give it a, I don't want to ring the dinner bell. I want that thing to come out. So I've done that twice, three times, four times. Oh, bollocks. That's not coming out. What do I do now? Do I give up on that? Well, that's well, that's it. I tried my best. You know, the rest of it is up to up to nature. What can we do? More. Do it. More. more. How do we get more? Hand over hand. Absolutely, Warwick. Well done. I wrap it around my hand and I give it another pull. And if that doesn't work, I wrap it around again. Okay. If we have the confidence to do that, I've seen a lot of cravats that have been cleared. 99% of cravats, if we can keep the glider straight, can be cleared if we have the confidence in how to use our stabilo line. Just grabbing it and pinging it like we're taught on our CP course isn't often enough. Get a wrap around your hand, give it a, prop, give it a proper whack, grit your teeth, make a, mm, make a face and give it a whack. Take another wrap, take another wrap, because eventually you're gonna pull that wingtip down into the open part of the cascade. And at least if you can't clear it immediately, you'll reduce it a lot but it's having the confidence. There's another thing there that can keep you a lot safer just by having, first of all, the knowledge of where is your stabilo line. Is it on my Bs or is it on my Cs? Like it is on some modern gliders. Don't be looking for it in a real life situation going, oh shit, where's my stabilo line? Know where it is. So that I can go to it, I can grab it and I can give it a pull. I can take a wrap, I can give it a pull. I can take another wrap. Right, there we go, we've cleared it. And we fly on and we continue with our day. A very simple basic concept. But if you ask half the pilots you see on the hill where their stabilo line is, they'll scratch their head. Some might even ask you what that is. The others will wonder if it's on the B's or C's or is it my big ear line? And then ask them how they would use it. A lot of them are very nervous because we don't know what the right answer is. So back to your point, Graham. Unfortunately, with a lot of the modern sea gliders now, we can't SIV them. So Ozon with the Photon, for example, Jin with the Bonanza 3, the Volt 4, I don't believe on the Volt 5. Now, the Volt 4, you can get a line set for 180 euros, um, and you can SIV that. You've got to remember, they're still sea gliders. They've still been through the same testing. Not a lot changes, but there is a massive difference. And the problem is, and when I spoke to Russ Ogden about this, I'm a, you know, we, we've known each other for a very long time. We get on very well, but there was an answer that he gave me that, that I didn't like. But I kind of agree with, but unfortunately, it's not realistic. So he said to me, if a, if a pilot goes out and gets a two-line C, like a Bonanza 3, for example, or like the Photon, they shouldn't need to do an SIV course. You should know by the time you get onto that level of glider. And we all know, guys, and I see it all the time. And it's one of my bugbears and something that upsets me a lot, is pilots will generally upgrade their kit to fill in the gaps in their knowledge. Oh man, I, I sucked. I went to Columbia this year and I sucked. I kept bombing out, I kept doing this. It's because of my glider. My glider doesn't have a great glide angle. Someone else was on a photon. Look how well he was doing. The glider doesn't fly itself. The pilot flies the glider. You need to be flying your glider at 100% and fully confident with it before you upgrade. When you feel that it's actually your glider holding you back, it's the time to upgrade. But unfortunately, there is a huge mindset of pilots that will keep buying better kit, better kit, better kit, 
hoping it will improve their personal skill level of flying. And it doesn't work. So in the old days, the, the Delta Four, we can put that through an SIV grade. The photon, unfortunately, we can't. The Bonanza Three, unfortunately, we can't because it puts a big stress on the on the gliders. So the answer from Jim, the answer from Russ Ogden was the pilot should know how to deal with stuff. You shouldn't be on the photon if you're asking questions about how to deal with a deflation situation. You should know. And, and actually, although I went, well, I, you know, okay, but there are pilots jumping onto it. Yeah, but they shouldn't be. So that's the bit that we need to get across to people is you need to know this kind of stuff before you start. I mean, they are wonderful gliders. The Photon's incredible. I saw a few of them out in Columbia this year, the Bonanza 3, the Volt 4, the Volt 5 is coming out. Wonderful gliders, but you need to fly them. You need to know how to fly them. You already should know and be super confident. If you're flying a sea glider, you should already have all this information. If you're flying a sea glider now, any of you that are listening, and any of this about the Stablo has been a surprise, you need to gel up a little bit more. Because these gliders, again, are great, but the higher the rating you go, the more the glider expects you to stop it, to catch it, to, again, the photon, the Bonanza 3. If you stop a dive after a deflation, they're wonderful. But what they also do, and the Volt 4 was a very classic for, and I've done a lot of SIVs with the Volt 4, is the two liners will have deflations they will they will kind of slow down a lot they will recover almost in a semi-state of deep stall before they recover the problem is if you're a very nervous pilot and, and it deflates and you start hitting the brakes you start to prevent the glider from recovering you start to not allow it to pick up speed you start to run into the territory of spinning or stalling it which unfortunately happened a lot with the uh xeno when the Zeno came out, it had a reputation of being the most fantastic, easy to fly, EMD. And it was, until something happened. There was a specific way of recovering it. Basically, it was the hands up, let it recover, deal with the resulting dive or wingtip core. But pilots were starting to break it, were starting to hammer on, were starting to do this nervous reaction because they didn't know what to do. And there were quite a few accidents, unfortunately. And again, it was down to the pilot <coughs> of knowledge. We need to be really sensible about the way we think. Better kit will not improve your flying. Better knowledge will improve your flying. So yeah, the, unfortunately, um, there's not a lot on the seas that, that we can SIV anymore. One last video, guys, I'd like to show you. Is, and what I'd like you to do is watch it and in your own mind, let me know what happened. We're going to have to do this telepathically, obviously, because we can't get the all the reactions from everyone. There's one last video I'd like to show you, and then we can go completely into to question and answer mode. Have a look at this incident. I'll give you the background quickly. I had a girl who came to South Africa with me a long time ago, uh, and she was fantastic. She was flying a, a, a Skywalk tequila. I had a couple of people flying advanced IOTA 2s. We have a thing called the built-on cut. Uh, where whoever sensibly does the most distance wins a cup full of Biltong. That's our little fun prize we have at the end. She won it. So she did better than the guys on the IOTA 2s. But she felt like she was working a lot harder for it. The guys on the IOTA 2s were higher. They were gliding further, blah, blah, blah. She'd only been flying a year. She left her equivalent in Croatia of the CP course. She had a, a tequila, a low NB. Quite an ambitious glider, but good for a talented beginner. She watched, and she had a whole year lined up. She was doing the Navita. She was doing the um, Shabra. She had a few amateur comps coming up. She was flying a glider well, but without really much respect. She was a little bit brave. She hadn't had anything happen. And she wasn't really understanding some of the consequences that could happen, which we kept talking about. However, she continued to see these two guys on IOTAs, flying over, flying higher. That classic, it's the glider. I need another glider to be able to do what they do. So she asked me if she could buy a IOTA 2. And I, and I said, at the moment, I think you should carry on the season, do it on this glider. You're flying it really well, get some experience, and then let's talk at the end of the season. She went home, she bought an IOTA 2. This is her very first flight on her new IOTA 2, three months after South Africa. Tell me what you think happened. Quite low, a time we need to switch on. Did you see that? All happened quite fast, didn't it? I'm going to say it again. Remember, it happened quite fast. 
Things do happen quite fast. Have a look again. What does she have? Can you see? Can you see? Can you see the weak narrative on full screen? What was a asymmetric collapse? Yes. Which side? So bear in mind the ridge is on her right hand side. What happens? The left wing tip. Left wing tip. So the glider is going to turn which way? Towards the hill or away from the hill? Away from the hill. Away from, away from the hill. That, that is lovely. That's a great situation. Now, look, the glider's deflated. What's it done? It deflates, it does what? It's dived. dived. What would you guys do in this situation? Gotcha. Break the dive. Yeah, fantastic. Okay, break the dive. That is a non-event. She's turned away from the hill. She's broken the dive. She flies away. That wingtip is about to recover. There we go. See the opposite wingtip because the glider's come so far forward. Oh, dear. If you'd have broken the dive, nothing would have happened. Now what happens? What's that? Oh, wing tip. Right. <laughs> yeah. On which side? The hillside. Right. Yeah, the opposite. So is that a, 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 an initial problem or is that a secondary situation? It's a secondary situation. Absolutely. Could have been prevented from catching the dive. Now, you've just had a, a deflation. It's pulled you around. All of a sudden now you're being pulled the opposite way. At this point, she didn't know what was up, down, left, right. She couldn't understand how she was going to the left and now suddenly she's going to the right. Okay, that's happened. Great, we've got to deal with it. What would you do? Because we have time. Reserve, <laughs> yes, reserve possibly would yeah. be a good option. She never even thought of that. She had it, she never considered it. What can you do at this moment? It's putting yeah. you right to the right, what can you do? Put left brake on. Left brake. Left, left brake break on. Can you see her right brake at this point? Yeah, She's it's really cool. She's putting a lot of right really brake on because in her mind, the incident happened on the left-hand side. So although she's now going into a right-hand autorotation, she's pulling as much right brake as possible because she's completely lost the plot at this point. She's completely confused. She's pulling a lot of brake on the opposite side. Thankfully, she lands in the trees. No physical harm done. Absolutely perfect. Nothing happened. Very, very lucky. The mental effect on her was catastrophic. It ruined a, a, a pilot with a lot of potential, ruined her season. It took her a long time to come back from that. Some very simple things. I'll play it one more time and we're done. A very simple thing. Okay, you've had a deflation. Catch a dive. If you catch a dive, how much break are we going to use? As much as you need. As much as you need. Yeah, no. Right then, you can have a word with yourself about your active flying. You can fly away. You can continue with your day. No harm done. Okay, it didn't happen. We're looking at our glider. We spot a, what's that called? Brilliant. Brilliant. What are we going to do about it? Control. Control um... Brilliant. At this point, though, we have our reserve system. And, and to just to, to finish off before we go to the question and answer, the last kind of thing is incidences can and do happen. Okay. We have our reserve system. Are you guys fully aware of how to use it? Of when to use it? How long are you going to fight with your glider? Because the reserve system, guys, isn't a guaranteed get out of jail card. Okay. A reserve is a lot better than the, the situation you were in. Stop that for a moment. And the reserve is a lot better than the situation you're in, but it doesn't mean you're going to be completely safe. What environment are you over? When you look down, are you over rocks? Are you over trees? Are you over some environment that, that isn't particularly friendly? It's a lot better than the situation you're in but it's an absolute last resort and it doesn't mean that we're going to get away with it scot-free. We can't sit back, read the paper, drink our tea and everything's going to work out. How are you going to use your reserve system and at what point do you choose to fight the glider or try and stop it? At what point do you choose to go for your reserve? It's a scary subject to talk about, but it's something really worth thinking about. How many of you go flying and tickle your reserve handle? Do you know where it is? Honestly? It's a really good thing to do. Every time I go, and I fly a lot of different harnesses. So every time, not every time, but I do fly out and I just, I give it a little tickle. There it is. I just get the little bit of muscle memory. There it is. Because when something happens and I'm in panic mode, I need to, I don't need to be hunting around for it. I need to know where that handle is. Great. How are you going to use it? What are you going to do? What happens? We're going to grab, grab the handle. We're going to pull it out. Okay. Now, 
this is a lovely scenario. We're going to grab our handle. We're going to pull it out. There it is in our bag. Now we've checked our elastic bands. We've checked our carabiners. We've done our studios checks. Congratulations. All of that bit is really good. What are we going to do with it now? First thing to remember is to what? To chuck it. Yeah, don't forget to let go of the handle. Um, great. So all of you in your seat now could go down by your bum, could do this and could do that. Do you ever remember in uh, when we were kids, they had the thing called the wall of death and you'd stand there, there were no safety straps, the thing would spin and the floor would drop away and you'd be pinned to the wall. Oh, if you had, if you, maybe they just had that in Western Supermare. There's right. a thing called G-Force, auto rotation. I mean, you're never going to throw your glider when you're flying, uh, throw your reserve when you're flying straight and level. You're going to be under a considerable amount of G-Force. That has a massive impairment of how well you can move your extremities outside away from your body. OK, so one of the things we've got to think about is to know where our reserve handle is. So if you're trying to pull it, oh my God, and the G-force is kind of stopping you from getting it out. Do you give up? Do you go, well, I tried and that's, uh, you know, do you like the Hamlet and get the boom, 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 if you remember the Hamlet advert. What are you going to do about that? The G-force is strong enough because this happened to me in Argentina a long time ago. The G-force is strong enough that you feel your pins go, but you cannot bring your arm out here. Do we maintain pilot? thought, or do we become a passenger? Because, oh shit, I wasn't expecting that. Because when I did it in school, when Lee was talking about it, sat in his nice comfy chair, we could do all of this and all of this. What are we gonna do now? Oh, Christ, I can't bring my arm out. Try and stop the, yes. the gravity force by breaking the other side and then hopefully be able to throw it. Could do, yes, or you, have, you, do have, you do have another hand. I'll just pull it up, not on a side, just up. Could try, but also the, the problem might be as well, you'll pull it up against the harness. Don't forget you've got another hand. If you've made the decision that you've lost control of your glider fully, you have two extremities available. And what I had to do in Argentina when I tried to pull it, and what I've had to tell a few guys in my 11 years, I've had uh, 11 or 12 reserve deployments on SIVs, which considering the amount of people who go through, isn't that many. But I had an incident in Argentina where I could not pull my reserve out because I was sucked into my seat. I got my other hand across, and I used my other hand, and uh, trust me, when that incident occurs, you formulate the strength of 10 lines. But you have the other hand available to be able to pull it out in an extreme situation. That's an extreme situation that doesn't occur very often whatsoever. The normal situation is you reach down, you grab it, you pull it out. How are you gonna throw it? What do you do? Do you drop it? Do you throw it up? Do you throw it across you? Do you throw it out? Do you throw it down? because it's really important. What we don't want is for our one. I have three systems in my acro harness because I, I like to be secured. I have a base harness, I have two reserves, great. I have lots of options. We all generally in our normal flying have one option. And how you throw that reserve is super key to the result it's going to have. Do we want to throw it out parallel to us, up a little bit, down a little bit? What would you do? Have you thought about it? Say again? Throw it in, into open yeah. space. Throw it into open space, yeah. In an auto rotation situation, the danger we have if we throw it straight out is that the glider comes, and the most disappointing feeling in the world is to watch your reserve uncoming from the back. And don't forget, you've done your studious check. So you are very happy now that this is coming out and it's about to, oh, and the great white shark of your leading edge comes around and catches it, which happened to me. I managed to pull it out of the leading edge. Everything worked out fine. There isn't really a right or wrong answer to this one. My best advice is to try and throw it at about a 45 degree angle. So if you imagine your shoulder to your hand is at about a 45 degree angle, you're gonna be able to throw it where it has enough. If you drop it straight down, the chances are as you're descending, you're gonna get slack in the lines. It's a lot more difficult and it's gonna take a lot more time for the reserve to come out. If you throw it completely out parallel to you, there's a chance it can catch in the lines or the glide. So the, the best advice, it's not right or wrong, it's just the best advice and the only advice I can give because you've got to do something, is to think about throwing it at about a 45 degree angle where it's coming out with some tension, but hopefully it's going to miss the, the glider if you're in that unfortunate situation. But things like that, as scary as they are, are good things to think about. What would I do in that situation? Well, again, right back to how we started. If I fly my glider properly, if I use my brake range properly, if I manage the way I'm turning and using energy of my glider, if I understand the consequence of energy that I build up, how to deal with that, I'm not going to be in that situation, but it's great. And again, SIVs are great 
for covering every bit and part and parcel of what we do. We're prepared for any situation. So if it does happen, we're not a passenger. We're not a rabbit in the headlights. We're not sat there going, uh, now then. What was it Lee said ago? I was it like a couple of years ago. I remember Lee saying something about, you know, tickle your handle, know where it is. Check your reserve system, make sure it's good. Don't trust anyone else. Make sure you're happy with it, that it's good. And around about a 45 degree angle, remembering to let go of the handle is your best option. Great. Your reserves come out. You get a very reassuring ton. <laughs> Oof, that's great. Then you start to feel like the action man. When you were a little kid, I used to run up to my parents' bedroom window and I used to throw my action man out the window. Fantastic. Your glider, annoyingly, no matter what mess your glider was in, the moment your reserve comes out, the tension comes off the line, your glider will sort itself out and go, hey, hey, hey I'm ready to go. What's the danger of that? Because once we've thrown our reserve, that isn't the end of the of the situation. What do we need to do after that? Disable the, the power glider. Yeah, we need to stop the thing interfering. What I see, I've seen quite commonly in, and I saw it unfortunately this year in Colombia, and I've seen it on uh, in Turkey because everyone in Turkey is falling out of the sky whether they're doing acro, whatever it might be. If you allow your glider to regain flight and to uh, to start to get tension on the lines, it's going to fight against your reserve. It's going to do what we call downplaning. And your descent rate is going to go from a happy survivable four and a half to five meters a second to eight or nine meters a second. That's like you climbing up to the first story in your house and jumping out the bedroom window. You're probably not going to kill yourself, but it's not going to end great. You're going to be limping for a few days. We have got to sort our glider out. How are you going to do that? Does anyone know? Have you thought about it in the worst case scenario? Grab whatever you can, preferably on one side, and pull it all into your body and get it as close to you as you can and under control. Yeah, anything you can. Again, there's not really a right or wrong answer. Anything you can to stop that glider flying. The best scenario, it's a, it's a bit more tricky over water, but over land, the best scenario, if you cannot stop it, from because the problem is if you pull a lot on one side, you can get the glider what we call windmilling. So we've got to be quite careful of that. What you can do is you can take the brakes and you can wrap them around your hands, around your hands, around your hands, around your hands, till you completely stall the glider. The glider then, after a certain amount of wraps, will completely stall. You can then gather it in. The problem if you're over water is then you land in the water with a lot of lines around your hand. Landing in water with a paraglider is, is a really horrible experience. Um, and it's why we have a boat on the SIV and we are underneath the pilots. If you land in water, you want someone to come and rescue. It's a very unpleasant situation because you have a lot of loose lines that can start to, to wrap themselves around you. But the quickest way to get a glider in, especially over land, is to wrap the brakes and give it a pull. The glider stalls. At the moment it stalls, it's a bag of washing. You can pull it in, tuck it between your legs, and away you go. But it's really important to remember to stop your glider interfering with the with the reserve. So that's where SIV courses benefit because they give you those little extra bits of knowledge. They teach you not to be afraid of it. It's a scary subject, I get it. And 99% of pilots will never use the reserve. But if you were ever in that position, it's better to know what to do and not be caught out and not be in a position going, shit, uh, it's good to think about. It's good to be prepared. Then we're feeling confident because we're prepared for every situation. Well done, everybody. Let's hand it over to you guys. Any questions, anything like that that you've got? By the moment. Yes. Obviously, I just have to promote the, if you are landing in water, watch my video first. <laughs> the gummy experiment was a very good <laughs> yeah. one, actually. I would I would recommend that. We did a lot of experimentation with, uh, with gummy there. Because it's not, there's no right or wrong, guys. All I'm telling you tonight is ways I've kept myself safe. I don't applaud instructors and go, this is the way to do it. You do it this way. There are many ways we can launch a glider. There are many ways we can approach our flying. I do a certain thing that I find has kept me safe over the years, and I pass on the knowledge of what has kept me safe. There are plenty of different alternatives, and I'm always learning. I've been flying for 19 years, and I'm still learning. You know, And the thing we did with Graham was to experiment what is the best way to kind of land in water without getting the glider all over you, without getting lines wrapped around you? It's a very good video to, to watch. There's where is, where is the video, Gummy? Where will we find it? Uh, it's on YouTube. I'll uh, send a link on Telegram. Uh, but it's it was mainly not for spiralling in with a parachute. It was for if you were flying 
off, you know, the sea cliffs of Mull and you suddenly realised the wind changed and you weren't going to make it back to the beach. Um, what was the right thing to do? <laughs> so I'll, um, yeah, I'll share that afterwards. But anyway, carry on, carry on. <laughs> Just one thing, Lee, on that. Um, it's also very worthwhile having a hook knife to cut yeah. away if necessary. I was... Yeah. Um, on my reserve ride, I was just about to cut away when I did actually manage to break the wing. Well done. <clears throat> and where do you have the hook knife? Because quite a few people have them. <clears throat> and then you find they're in places that are not accessible. You've kind of got to have it in a place that you can easily access, uh, you know, you can easily get to it. Uh, yeah, hook knives for sure are, are, you know, are a great idea. Gin on my pot harness, they come with one on the cockpit. And it's there. I can, I can pull it out. In a worst case scenario, I can slice. I mean, it would be heartbreaking, but I would rather do that than... <clears throat> and save my life. <clears throat> yeah, you know, great advice. Have all the tools you possibly can. You'll probably never need them. But if they're there that one time, you've got it. Absolutely. <clears throat> but get a good one. Because, you know, you need something that's actually going to work. Some people get these little plastic ones off eBay and they're, they're no good. You, you know, you couldn't cut a piece of grass with it. So make sure you've got a good one that is nice and strong and solid. Because lines are tough, eh? And lines under tension are pretty tough. So make sure if you're going to get a hook knife, you've got a proper, a good one. And it's accessible. Yeah, we had a pilot in Scotland had an incident that he was going to use his hook knife, but found that actually the mouth of the hook knife wasn't wide enough to go over his reserve bridle yes. to change harnesses. So as you say, it's making sure yeah. what you're carrying is actually suitable to do the job and just simple yeah. little things. Does it actually kind of bridle go inside the, the hook knife? Absolutely, yeah. A, a really valid point. Lee, I've got a question about SIV and stalls. You've, you, know, you haven't really talked about stalling on SIV here. And I wonder whether you don't <laughs> consider it to be as important a skill as some other SIV instructors obviously do. And yeah. how but do you use it out in the wild? No, our stalls ruined SIV. The, the problem is what we've been doing for a very long time is we've been fighting an uphill battle to to try and, and, and encourage you to do SIVs because they're a lot of fun. They are terrifying. When you first come, I mean, the commitment to get on the plane, the commitment to come, that commitment on the first day. When we come to do the deflation exercises on the Monday morning, the pilots get in the van like they're going to execution. When they get back after the two flights, some of them are almost disappointed. They were expecting a lot more fuss and bother. And, and what I want SIVs to be about is about controlling and learning to control the basic stuff stalling and, and i get very frustrated so in, in the early days uh, when i did my first siv with, with jockey they were part of the course stalls for me are not part of the course it's a lot of um nonsense about you're going to go and stall your glider to sort yourself out of stuff i do now because i have thousands of them a stall is something that is true it can clear a problem but you need to be rehearsed and refreshed. Doing a couple of stalls on an SIV course is a badge of honour, and it's something about Billy Big Bollocks managed to do a stall control. I mean, it is the ultimate, and I don't mean to sound defensive about this, guys, but this is something that I just want to dispel, is doing a couple of stalls on an SIV course, nine months down the line in Brazil when you have a big cravat situation, stalls have a horrendous effect if we get them wrong. You need to be 100% understood and confident with the technique that you are doing to be able to do them, okay? And what used to happen is pilots would come and they would have a really good SIV week. They would deal with auto rotation, they would deal with deflations, they would learn spiral dives, they would learn a sat, they would get their wing overs going, they would have a lot of fun. And then came the last day, obligatory stall day. They would have a nightmare of a situation, the glider would buck forward, they would fall through the lines, it would be horrendous. When they get on the plane to go home, all they can remember is that. Everything they did up to that point is now irrelevant because all they can remember is that terrifying situation that they had from a stall. Stalling is only useful if you want to get into proper acrobatic paragliding. It is our control alt delete in acrobatic paragliding. It is not a, um, a amateur or a weekend warrior stall alt and delete. For me in acro paragliding, before you can honestly say that you have them down, the benchmark is 200 stalls. Now you will get them down quicker than that, but by the time you've done 200 stalls, you will have every single scenario that could possibly crop up happen to you 
before you can call yourself a master at them. And people who go, yeah, I did a couple of stores on the SIV. If I had a big cravat, like the ones you saw on the videos earlier, I'll just stall my glider out. If you try and stall a glider with a cravat with symmetrical braking, you are going to tip back very asymmetrically. Your body will swing underneath, you'll rise a twist. There is a technique. There is a way of, of countering with the opposite brake to come down, to stall the glider straight. It's just a, it's a misnomer for me, unless you're going to put the work in, okay? If you want to do that and you want to consider it a technique, and it is a technique, absolutely. And I use it in Acro quite a lot. It is our control alt delete. It's our happy place. When you get a glider nice and stable in flyback, it's our happy place. It's our happy place. But one or two on an SIV course, don't cut it. It's got to be something you train for regularly and that you understand 100%. Because the consequences of getting it wrong are severe. And in fact, on that note, if you don't mind me interrupting, this is the perfect opportunity to show you one more thing, okay? Uh, I want to show you one more video because this answers the question perfectly well. Now, again, what it shows, and this is the worst of the worst, don't forget, I have dragged through my snuff videos to find the worst of the worst. What this shows you on an ENA glider, this is a Gin Bolero, okay? And the girl had done a few stalls with me before. I was shocked that this happened. She'd done a few stalls with me before, but as she was stalling the glider, she kind of went, oh, I'm not really comfortable. So she lifted her hands up a minute to get comfortable. The glider had already committed to a stall. And this is the result of it. But again, it shows what can be recovered. But this is why in a real life situation, I don't believe, unless you're really, really experienced with it, <clears throat> you would use it because the risk is, as we'll see. ENA glider. Because don't forget, ENAs will look after you guys. Don't you worry, your ENA will look after you. At that point, she wasn't particularly comfortable, not realizing the glider had already stalled. She put her hands out. Simple mistake. What's that? Auto rotation with a riser twist, just to add to the excitement. We had a lot of heights that we're trying to work with it. We're trying because we had height, she just didn't have the strength. We're trying. She got her two hands over. She didn't have the strength. <laughs> Hallelujah. Don't forget, guys, your reserve is your lifeline, right? <clears throat> it's going to save you every single time. Where did that reserve go? Up, left, right? Where did it go? Did you see? Have a look again. See where that reserve went, which is why we talked about where to throw it. It went down below her. <clears throat> because it's very easy to sit in this scenario and go, yeah, I could pull it out and I could throw it at a 45 degree angle. Now get yourself riser twisted in some G-force. She did what she could. She got the reserve out and all she could do at that point was let it go. It's all you can do sometimes, okay? Out of interest, Lee, what sort of Gs are in that? Because, um, you know, she's backwards almost a sat. Um, yeah. Is that a lot less than say a, a normal spiral dive? Yes, it's a lot less than a spiral, but you're still looking at two or three Gs, potentially, maybe four at the most, but it's a lot less than an intense spiral. But it's still enough to, for her, it was enough to make it quite awkward to throw it. But she's thrown it. So hallelujah, we're good. We've thrown our reserve, because we know when we throw our reserve, it's tea and biscuits, we're going to be fine. That's what it's there for. Because <clears throat> that was unrecoverable. There was nothing we could do about that, right? We've, we've lost control. We've gone for our reserve. We've thrown it. <clears throat> it's coming don't you worry i said don't you worry that thing's gonna open up any oh dear what now guys that reserve has now gone into the lines we have an auto rotation situation your one option yeah there you go you see that's a very scary situation now if that happened to you in a real life situation where you've had no training you've had no conversation you've had no thought process that is in a very uncomfortable, disappointing situation to be in on a Tuesday afternoon, okay? <laughs> Most pilots now may well turn into a rabbit in the headlights, a passenger. We did everything we can, so they light the, the cigar and that's me done. Or we can remain and be a pilot and start working. As hard as you can with both hands.
She's flying. She sorted her and she's flying. That would be a situation that you could land easily in over a landing field. Okay, that time she couldn't make it to the beach. She wasn't safe. We took it to the water because there was a lot of drag with the reserve being in the line. So she had to work quite hard to keep it straight. We chose the option to go for the water, but you could land like that. But that is a great example of why doing a few stalls on an SIB course to then go eight months later in Brazil at three o'clock on a Wednesday, I'm just going to stall my glider out. Simple mistake. Okay? It's something that needs training. Prevention is better than the cure because we've just seen, at the worst, that's one of the worst videos I have. I scoured 11 years of footage to get you the worst I could possibly get. I don't want that to frighten you or to put you off. It's an extreme example of what can happen, but everything I've shown you tonight was recovered and was flown. All the gliders recovered and flew from extreme situations. I promise you, you're not going to have. That was from us really pushing it. These were pilots to Ghana Buzz as well that we were really pushing it with. But it's just not to fall into the trap of my ENA will look after me. It will be fine. I, I trust in my glider. You've got to trust in yourself. You've got to make sure you have a good knowledge base and that we know what to do in the right situation. Anyway, back to you guys. Any more questions? Can I ask a question? I'm yeah. signed up to do the uh, course, um, and uh, I notice there's quite a lot of um, situations where um, quite a lot of female examples, quite quite a lot of examples where somebody's not got the strain. Yeah. Um. So, uh, and you kind of put my fears to rest about being anxious about going on the course. Mm -hmm. Um, because you know you flip in and out of you sign up at a point when you're dying to go and you're all up for it, and then I guess I'm oh, expecting yeah. to get a little bit more nerve wracking yeah. towards it. And you said people are nervous on the plane and going up yeah. the hill and stuff. So, um, you kind of put my mind at rest. I think you're going to be kind of getting everybody into a, a state where we're comfortable. The glider's moving about, and it's going to be gradual. But is there anything I should do uh, to prepare, either psychologically or physically? <laughs> The, the first of all is, is congratulate yourself on feeling nervous because that means you're taking it seriously. That means you understand that what we're going to do, like my sister can't, under, like I, I love my act, right? I do this SIB stuff. She sees all the pictures. My sister can't understand how someone can go up on a perfectly formed aircraft and stop it flying and, and do crazy things. Like she would never fly on the easy jet plane and expect them to break a wing off halfway yeah. through the flight. Yeah. Being except, nervous. I, except I was in Bulgaria last August and things were happening to the glider um, and you know eventually when you fly mountains you realize that things just happen and yeah. you've not been fast enough back to flying enough yeah and, and when, most of the time you'll have deflations and nothing will happen I yeah. still I, I had I can't I'm a little bit I'm very anal with myself I'm my own worst critic I should be I own a school I run SIV courses I took a few deflations in Colombia this year because I was being a little bit lazy, a little bit sloppy. I'm looking around to guide. I'm, you know, I get very blasé at times. Nothing happens. Most of the time, nothing happens. What I'm looking to do is, is it diving forward? Good, I need to catch that. Has it probated? No. Have a word with myself about my active flying and carry on. I really respect pilots who come who are nervous because the pilots who come are like, yeah, I'm going to come. I'm going to smash it, Lee. I'm going to do this. Don't really have a healthy respect. We, have, we are in a, a very dangerous sport, not a very dangerous sport, but with the wrong attitude and a gung-ho, overconfident attitude, it, beca it can become a very dangerous sport. If we approach it sensibly, but that doesn't mean holding ourselves back and being too scared to do anything, okay? It means coming on the course, but being respect respectfully nervous. It means we're taking it seriously. It means we understand that what we're doing has potential consequences, but what we'll very quickly realize is it doesn't take a lot for the, for the, for the consequences to, to be reduced hugely. And with a little bit of knowledge, with a little bit of improvement in our own style of flying, we can start to think, I don't have to worry about dealing with that. Like I said, if my glider was going to fold itself away in the bag and I'm going to, those videos terrify me. I don't want to be the pilot in that situation. I'm, I'm human like the rest of you guys. I put a helmet on, I put my harness on, I go flying. I get scared at times in really rough hair. Fortunately, over time, I've built up a confidence in my skill level that there's not that much that can catch me out. I can't prevent everything, and I'm not saying there's there's nothing that can catch me out, but I feel confident that I can deal with most situations. So what we do is we just get you down the line of 
making your personal flying good. We look at your takeoffs. How are your takeoffs? Are there improvements we can make there? How are your landings? There's some improvements we can make there because that is a safety issue as well. Being able to land nicely, being able to take off properly, being confident, being able to turn nicely, not being afraid of our brake range. Understanding what the glider does. Again, like I said earlier, is a glider will deflate, turn, dart. Deflate, turn, dart. You'll start to go, oh, it's a really recognizable pattern. And all of a sudden we start to realize there's not too much I need to do. I need to break a dive. I need to check my wingtips. Um, but it is it is a, it is a, a, a very scary concept to come and do. I hope that we're starting to break through that. And also what, what I believe in and, and what a lot of the modern schools do now, which I like, is it's not a tick box exercise. I will have pilots with 200 hours, but I will push a lot harder. Or I will have pilots on certain gliders that want to achieve certain things that I'll push a lot harder. I will have certain pilots with less hours or less confidence that we won't push too hard. Because if we scare you, you're going to go home again. You're going to be on that plane on the way home in a worse situation than you were before you came. So it's about building up. And if you enjoy that one and you've got, you take home a few lessons, you can come and do another one. Then we can push it a little bit more and then we can push it a bit more. But what's important is, is that when you choose to do SIV with whoever it might be, that they take you on an individual basis. They understand the level you are, the confidence that you have, there are some obligatory things we have to do. Everyone needs to go through the deflation exercises. That is non-negotiable. But we don't have to go through massive, violent um, auto-rotation scenarios, which I will put some pilots through. Stevie's there. I see you. I'll put you through a few of those, Stevie. I can see you over there. Hello. Stevie's been through some proper ones, but you built up to it really well. It's about just, it's about finessing your flying, making your general flying really good. And that will prevent you from a lot of stuff. So well yeah. done for a bit. You know, Thanks. Nerd, looking nerd. forward to it. Looking forward to it. Thanks I a lot. Wait. Oh, can't wait. <laughs> Can I jump in with a question then? Uh, it's just to go back to Warwick's question about stalls. And uh, yeah, I think it's probably not a manoeuvre to do on the first SIV, maybe the second. But I think it's worth, if you can put the time in doing them, not to have as a tool, but to have as knowing about the stall and the recovery is you might get yourself into a situation, say, where you are trying to recover from auto rotation. If you have gone into auto rotation and you might be scared to pull the brake hard enough to get out of that. Um, and on SIVs, we've done stall exits from auto rotations just so that you can get out really quickly within quarter of a turn. Yeah. Um, or if you accidentally store your wing, if you have a big frontal and you bang on the brakes and you get on the brakes for too long mm -hmm. and your wing stalls, then you know that you know what it feels like for uh -huh. to be in that stall situation and you can recover. You can understand how much it's going to shoot and how much to catch because it's a different shoot from, say, recovering from a rapid exit or the kind of shoot you might get from a rapid exit where you've got a lot longer to to break the dive um so for, i think for all of those reasons not to have as a tool but just to have for confidence and to understand the stall and the recovery from the stall um i think it's still a really important maneuver absolutely and, and i don't mean to kind of poo poo it um because and especially when you're flying it so what you said then is absolutely key on the new two liner style gliders they take a little while to inflate and the problem is with a bit of a bit of um adrenaline pilots hit the brakes too early and what's happened a bit with pilots who jumped on the vault four was in a recovery situation ended up stalling them so and and you you're kind of right maybe on your first siv but what i'll do at the end of the week is there's some pilots who go lee i want to stall well okay i'll look you know i'll look at you through the week and let's see how you are. And I, and I stress the point, put it in a separate box. Remember every good thing you've done this week. And then think about the stall as we're going to do it. We're going to intentionally do something. So just remember, whatever happens during the process, it's an intentional thing that we've done. Don't let it ruin what you've done up to then. Doing it on the second one, once you've got into staff, great. I mean, whenever a pilot is ready and they feel ready, there is no harm as long as it's as long as it's not the kind of thing they go, well. I'm going to do this. And in eight months time in Brazil, it's understanding how it works. If you've got a cravat situation, what's the way to deal with that? But you're right. Man. People may spin their glider out of a cravat situation. They may well store their glider by coming on too early. If you're a bit experienced with it and you know the right time to keep the brake, you know the right time to release the brake. It's a fantastic thing. 
you know, but you've got to want to do it. That's what I want a pilot to do. I want them to want to do it. And I want them to to focus about it and really think it. You know, everything you said there, I mean, show me. Have you done them before? <clears throat> yeah, I've got my eighth one coming up in September. Well done. But it, but you know, you're, you the way you've just described that is perfect because you're someone who's going to think about it and take it seriously and think about the scenario you're going to use it in. Um, so I, I don't mean to poo-poo them. I just don't think it's necessary all the time for every pilot. I don't think they should be a compulsory part of the SIV course. I think they should be an optional bit. Um, they are the extreme version of glider control. It's fantastic. And they're very easy. Once you've got them down, they're actually very easy and they're very fun to do. But it's just you need a pilot to really take it seriously and understand that it's a great, easy maneuver to do. But there are consequences. So don't go half-hearted at it. Go with it with the, the correct level of respect, if that makes sense. As it sounds like you've done. Yeah. I've got sorry, yeah. The eighth SOV, not the eighth stall. No, I've done hundreds of stalls. <laughs> well done. And they're fun, right? When you get them done, yeah. actually a lot of fun. They're a very easy, lot of fun thing to do. It's just making sure that you understand them and you and you you dedicate yourself to to, to getting them down. Huh. Well done. I think we've got quite a few pilots in Scotland anyway that have been moving on to two liners I'm one of them anyway uh, what I did find quite useful in the last SIV was to practice the stall more for learning how to manage the span of the glider but also as Steve was saying there because they recover differently you need to have the respect for letting it dive and it's sometimes against your instinct to sort of let the glider go then mm -hmm. catch it so I think it, I found it quite useful just to be practicing the stall. And actually, as a result, you got incidents, you got little cravats in the wingtip as a result of doing stalls that you then had to manage. So you were almost getting like some free SIV training as a result, which I find Absolutely. And I, and I realize because I, I, I'm glad you brought that up, because when I said earlier about we can't do the SIVs, what we can't do is a deflations. And I was thinking, ah, oh, just pretty much anyone with a Bonanza 3 or a photon is now going, well, I won't bother coming. What we can't do is the big deflation stuff. You can do the stalls. You can do the spiral dives. You can do managing it at different angles of pitch and roll. And you're absolutely right. You've got to have the confidence in letting the glider fly and not being afraid of the dive, but equally not let it get dive out of out of control. That's a, a really valid point, which I'm glad you said, because I, I kind of pigeonholed myself earlier by saying that we don't do SIV. We just don't do the deflation exercises. We can still do a lot of the dynamic stuff and still, and they still really well. Again, it's just having the right technique. And, and like you say, you will generally come out often with cravats on one side, the other. So it does give you plenty of scenarios within the one maneuver to practice. It's not that you can't do stuff with them. We just can't do the accelerated, non-accelerated deflation exercises. Is that the deflations with anything that uses collapse lines? Well, they don't. So the Volt 4 had options of collapse lines. The modern ones don't. The Photon, I believe, don't. The Bonanza 3, I believe, don't. Um, the problem, it, the, I mean, actually, that's not that's not quite true. You can put, because they have them for the testing. So you can put collapse lines on. I apologize. You can put collapse lines on. It's the stress it puts the glider under. So with the Bonanza 3, after 150 hours, they recommend changing the line set. So if you start doing big deflation exercises with it, you're putting the glider under unnecessary stress. So it's not that it can't be done. You, you can buy the line sets that they used in the testing, but it's putting the glider under quite a lot of stress that it, that it doesn't need. It's already quite sensitive. That's the problem. So if you had spare line set or ready to do it, just an extra cost on yes, the SIV. It is. Well, it, what you need to do is you need to go to the manufacturer and you need to buy the line set from them. So they have the specific testing line set they use. And the problem is it's putting on an entire new line set. So for the Volt 4, example, you would have the A-line line set from the uh, initial um, uh, Malions all the way up. So it's quite a job. It takes a little while to do. It's quite a job. So you can do, but you've just got to understand that you're putting the glider under quite a lot of stress when the glider already at about 150 hours needs a line inspection to a line change. So what they say is you should already know how to deal with it because again, the responses are the same. A glider will deflate, turn, dive, ENA, ENB, ENC, END into a more dramatic level, but the reactions are the same. So they expect the pilot who's flying those to know already what to do. But it's not to say you can't, but it will put it under under 
stress it doesn't really need, if that makes sense. Hi there, Lee. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Um, I'm what I'd classify as a low airtime pilot, having just done my CP last summer. Um, yeah. And I wanted to get another season in before signing up for an SIV course. Um, you talked about on this talk tonight about gear checks, um, big ears and speed bar and the things that we should be doing in a club environment to remain current in, in, in not just emergency scenarios, but just for more tools in the toolbox and keep them yeah. at hand. Um, my question is, have you got any other recommendations for things that we should be doing in a club environment to be more safe and have more tools that we can do outside of an SIV environment? Yeah. The, the first thing I'll ask you is, why do you feel you need to do another season before you do an SIV? <clears throat> um, more to put context into the the problem. So I fully accept that you could go straight out of CP and do an SIV course, but I kind as of want to experience. As long as you're good at take off and landing. That, the requirement is you need to be confident with taking off by yourself, landing by yourself. Although there's a lot Underst of... Yeah. Yeah, understood. But I kind of wanted to experience a bit of thermaling first, and I kind of wanted to experience um, a bit more of the, the choppy wind conditions and, you know, well, without putting better, myself in danger, super... but... Wouldn't it be better to be super confident knowing where to put your brake range rather than get into that going, well, is this good? Is that good? Uh, should I do that? Should I not? Whoop, should I? Wouldn't it be better? This is something that, that, that I talk to pilots a lot about. Isn't it better to be fully prepared? Now, the thing, like, again, it's not all about the deflations and the recovery and the incident. It's about how you fly. It's about learning the full potential of your glider. It's about being able to make really clean turns, being being confident with pulling brakes in carabiners or not. Um, and, and to get into those choppy air situations or get into thermaling, isn't it better to be really confident 100% with the glider in terms of what you can do with weight shift, turning, managing your energy, so that if you turn a little bit tight in the thermal, get spat out and the glider pitches, that you recognize what it is, that you can deal with it. Because the thing that gets quite scary is when things are happening that you're not quite understanding. And although, I mean, you could, you could even come on the SOV and go like, I don't want to, well, it's not an option. I don't want to do deflation. It's a compulsory part there. There is no option for that. But it, it doesn't, you know, again, it, it has to be tailored towards the individual. There are certain compulsory things to go over. But when you come back suddenly going, crikey, that doesn't mean anything. That is great. The glider can do this. Oh, I just need to break it there. Rather than going out there and trying to kind of suck it, see, learn for yourself, building up. Because isn't the point of an SIV to be able to go into those conditions much more comfortably? If that makes sense, it's just an intro. When we're like, it's just interesting to get the mindset because this is what I, I like to hear pilots say, and then and then discuss what the mindset is because it helps us then understand the thinking of 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 pilots and and how we can encourage pilots to do it, or how sometimes we can say maybe just wait a bit. We don't want to scare you. We don't want to put you off. It's the most important thing is we don't want to put you off. Um, and then what was your oh yes, you see your main point. Well, yeah, what you can do is. You've got to put the practice in. You've got to go out and ground handle. And again, not just reverse launching, forward launching. You've got to go and play with the glider. You've got to think things through. You've got to, you've got to sort of say, well, what kind of flying do I want to get into? I want to get into this kind of flying. And what you've really got to do, which is really important, is you've got to weed out the wheat, uh, the, uh, wheat from the chaff. So find people. I mean, your club is great. And, and the one thing, and I've said to Andy this before, I really love your club because there's a real enthusiasm and there's proper information. You know, the, the chats I've been having with Andy over the last couple of months has been like he's been reading my mind. Everything he said to me is exactly the kind of thought process I have, which means he's passing over proper information. You are going to come across pilots who are in a little bit of a power struggle. You know, in my real life at work, I'm a nobody but on the hill. I'm more experienced than you. So I'm going to, I'm going to tell you this. I'm going to tell you that I've heard Chinese whisper come from this to this to this. And I'm going to tell you there, you've got to kind of make sure the, the people you're getting information from are people that you can trust and that it's the right information. But it's just the basic stuff. Just check your kit every now and again. How many of you check your triangular malleons that connect your risers to your, um, to your, your, sorry, your risers to your lines? They can come undone. And I've seen a couple of incidences where the A-lines have popped up, have popped off just after launch because people haven't checked those little malleons. There's not too much you need to do. You need to practice. You need to understand the level you're at, where you want to be, and how to get there. 
So don't force yourself off in condition. If you get to the hill and you go, God, it's a little bit strong, but I haven't flown for a week and I'm going along, you know, I'm, I'm not going to be able to fly for the next two weeks. So maybe I'll, maybe I'll give it a go. Well, maybe if you've really practiced your ground handling and you feel confident with that, you know, if you put yourself or you push yourself too fast, too quick, um, you can end up scaring yourself. And we're, you're at such a delicate stage at this point with confidence. Slow is fast. There's no rush. Do the basics really well. Make really good decisions. You never know what you're saving yourself from. But your the, the feeling of regret, I knew I shouldn't have taken off. I knew but I only had this Tuesday to fly and I, I knew I wasn't sure about it. That will set you back a lot further than making a good decision to walk down the hill. Maybe you can't fly, it's a bit strong, but watch other people, watch what they're doing. Start to have a look, guys, at the people who are taking um, pride in their flying and the people who are launching a bit shit, turning around, running a little bit uncoordinated, people who are coming out of turns, a glider pitching around. Start to have a look at the difference between a good controlled pilot and a pilot who's getting away with stuff. And then start to look at what the difference of what they do is and start to practice. Start to look at yourself in the air and go, where are my big ears lines? I'm not going to do them right now, but where are they? There's one. There's two. If you've got a bit of high, pull them in. People are scared to pull them in. It's something we're supposed to do. It's a tool we're supposed to have in our box. So if you've got the respective height, pop in a big ear, pop in another one. Hold them in for a bit. When shift turn to the left, when shift turn to the right, and let them out. Where's your stabilo line? Ah, oh, there it is. It's that funny coloured one on my Bs or my Cs. You can give it a little tug and it will go boop, boop, with the ear. You know, it'll just bring the wingtip in and out. You know where it is. So further down the line, if you had any issue, or if you were flying in conditions where the wind picked up, or you were a little bit higher than you should have been, or whatever it might be, you've got the confidence in your basic skills. If it's really smooth air one day, don't be afraid to push your speed bar on. Practice what you've got at the moment. Your pickup tools as you go along. Do another year's flying, like you say, get comfortable, and when you're ready, do the SIV. In the meantime, don't be afraid to practice your big ears. Don't be afraid to practice your speed bar. Make sure your speed bar is completely symmetrical. Be happy. If you don't know how to take your reserve out of your harness and put it back in again, go and find out. You know, you've got a great club. And one of the things that you have is, is an amazing club there with some really experienced, talented pilots. Go and ask them. A couple of times of pulling it in and out, you know how to do it. You'll start to feel confident. You can keep yourself really safe just on those basics. Does that make sense? But yeah, be perfect. Thank And the coaches on the hill or even in the pub are very, generally very approachable up here. Yeah. Um, and if they don't know, somebody, they're up there, they'll ask or even say, I don't know, check with yeah. someone. And that's really important as well. You know, I spend quite a bit of time now going, do you know what? Good question. I'm, I'm not sure. Rather than, because a lot of people will go, uh, well, just if you don't know, you don't know. Great. Then maybe you could go and find out as well. The problem is being on a hill, and then starting to give pilots advice, going down a road where you go, oh, shit, I've kind of gone down a rabbit hole here. Well, I'm not really sure what the answer is. I'll just keep blagging it because I don't want to lose face, lose face in front of this person. Be completely honest. If you're going to give advice to a pilot, make sure you know the advice you're giving. If you don't, it's not a problem. You know, there is no shame of a stupid question because we're all nervous. Everyone's nervous when they're paragliding to a certain degree it's respective so i'm not so nervous at taking off anymore but i'm nervous at some of the the maneuvers i do when i'm doing acro paragliding but it's the same level of fear just like it's good to help pilots but just make sure the advice you're giving is advice you're 100 co confident in because the likelihood is they're going to take that advice and they're going to pass it on and so on and so forth so helping is really good but just make sure the help you're giving is something you're really confident in yourself and don't overthink it too much it's a very nice simple sport with some very easy basics make sure your kit's good make sure you know where your big ears lines are make sure your speed bar's good and just make sure your reserve system's great that your malleons are done up how many of you check your pins before you take off i get people with this all the time i love it on sib courses and i do it all the time and so if you ever come on a trip with me now yeah there we go stevie you know about the sweet paper thing mm -hmm. what we do is we get some sweet papers and we'll put it in your reserve bin and then the idea is when you go to when you go to take off, you'll have checked your reserve pins, you'll have found the sweetie wrapper and you'll give it back to me or my launch marshal. If you haven't found the sweetie wrapper, it means you haven't checked your pins. Quite often around, uh, you know, I'm very lucky where I'm on the hill all the time. Quite often I see accidental deployments from pilots who've just not checked their pins. If you've had a bit of a dragging, okay, 
and you've gone across the hillside, it happens. I remember in South Wales being dragged face first across a, a hillside, going through a cow pack, crispy on the top, soft and yellow underneath, and, and getting up with a big yellow line across. You know, I've had all the lovely experiences you get at the low airtime pies. I didn't check my reserve after that. And I was, I was, I was about to retake off. One of the guys on the hill went, dude, your handle's hanging out. Never thought to check it. Check your reserve pins before you take off. Another way of keeping yourself really safe is just don't forget to have a look at your reserve pins and make sure they're good. Really simple stuff like that. Interestingly, I've noticed since I moved to a front mounted reserve, I don't check it as much as I used to. You know, before with a side mounted, it was all every flight. Yeah. Strangely enough, with a front mounted, I don't check it so much. And I, I realized that recently. So I do know. Yeah. Well done. Yeah. Well, I mean, good for good for recognizing it. It's really important. It's another really easy safety step you can make. Takes 30 seconds to go, yep, yeah, pins are good. Great. Has Lee put a sweetie wrapper in there? No. Brilliant. You're safe. That's one less thing to worry about. That's one less domino effect that will cause an incident later on. Some really simple things you can do. Any more for any more? Yeah, Lee, when are you going to do more podcasts? Oh, crikey, Mikey. <laughs> I'm <laughs> almost back on that. Yeah, we, well, with Christmas and uh, and the Columbia tours and the tourist tour, it's been a little bit difficult. I've got one to come. There's a few more coming up. We've got a few coming up this year, but I prefer to do them face-to-face. -face. It's not so easy to, to, to get face-to-faces organised when I've been away, but they're coming. They're coming back. Season three is the way. Awesome. They are absolutely awesome. So do catch oh. up. They're absolutely brilliant, mate. <laughs> oh, thank you, buddy. Yeah, there's a there's a few to there's a few to come. There is a few to come. Good stuff. I I, I actually had a sensible question for you. Um, just you mentioned earlier about the great white shark coming around and snapping up the reserve, and I think the video of the lass earlier doing the full stall and going into a bit of a cascade there answered it but is there is there any sense that you need to marry up the line lengths to the length of the the sort of the bridle and the reserve good question is that, i mean it's just not something that's ever occurred to me but you, yeah you just good basically. question the the idea with the reserve and your bridles are the reserve bridles and length that it comes out to at full stretch should be longer than your lines. So the idea is as you throw your reserve, it, it should be bridle lengthwise longer than the lines from your bright from your risers to your glider. But um what we find quite often is when people have had their reserves repacked. So some of the, the horrendous things and, and why I'm so keen on you guys being able to check your own kit is sending it away to someone else is not the answer. Because I've I've seen a reserve bridle should have a minimum of one meter between the reserve itself and the connection point, because you've got to be able to throw the bloody thing away. And I what I've seen is quite a lot of reserves that have the bridle really kind of uh, tied up with elastic bands and what have you. You pull your reserve out and it's already under tension now. You don't want the thing to open up too close to you. Because the, the chances are it can go in the lines, the glider, or back on yourself. You need to have enough length to be able to throw it away. One, to give it tension. As it picks up speed, the tension will then break the mouth lock and open the bag. That's important. Because maybe you're in a spin situation where there is not a lot of air. Um, so you need something that's going to give it a bit of tension, that's going to pull it out properly. And you need it to be able to clear your glider. So you, you need at least a minimum of a meter between your reserve and your connection point to the main shoulder bridles. And ideally you want that reserve to be able to, so I don't know, it depends on gliders, I guess, but it, it depends on whatever your length is from your from your, your risers to your harness. Ideally your bridle should be a little bit longer. Mostly they come like that standard. If you think about having a meter between your reserve and the, um, and the carabiner, most of the time that will do it nicely. It's not having the, the bridle too crimped up so that when you throw your reserve, you've only got a few inches here and it's already putting tension, which is opening the bag. You need to make sure you can throw it away and it has enough slack to be able to get it away. But the standard rated bridles with reserves have taken care of all of that. Right. So you shouldn't need to worry. They are, they are already programmed to be that length. It's just not taking too much slack out of the connection between the reserve and the the connection to your bridles from the harness, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. No, that makes sense. Yeah. 
Yeah, I was just wondering because if you're changing wings, obviously, then you know, do you then have to think? They're about all how- relatively the same. There's not a great deal of, of difference. Acro gliders are a little bit longer. Serial gliders generally are pretty much the same. So most, if you've got if you've got a reputable rated reserve, it will have the correct length of bridle equally with the with the harness. It's when you buy second hand kit that you want to you want to be careful. So if you buy second hand kit, you want to make sure that it has the correct bridle system. If you you know if you buy a second hand reserve, which people do, to make sure it has the correct bridle length. But generally, with new kit, it's it's already done, already given for you. Yeah, brilliant. I've got to pick through my kit. It's pretty much all second hand. <laughs> <laughs> have a little look up. Get the cobwebs out. Oh, I'm a <laughs> Maybe it's a big bag of confetti. Yeah. <laughs> like we, is there any exercises you could recommend to people coming to the SIV course later in the year? You know, if there was a nice soaring day. Hmm. Um. Again, nothing. Nothing that you're you're not fully understood of. So basically, like the main thing is take pride in your flying. Start having a look at what you're doing. Start looking at how your launch was. Was your launch good? Good? Or did you get away with it? Did you get away with that one, the last one, or the one before that? Everyone has a bad launch. I, I have been flying 19 or almost 19 years. And there is no way that for the rest of my career, I'm going to launch perfectly every time. Every time I turn up on launch, that's what I aim to do. But I bet at some point I'm going to trip, get caught up, whatever it might be. I bet I'll have a couple of launches during my career from here on in that won't be that pretty. But don't let it be acceptable to start looking at how you're flying. How was your launch? Is there something that keeps happening? Oh, my glider goes to the side. But if I just keep running, I'll get away with it. Whatever it might be. How are your landings? Oh, we're going to land it on my bum again. Or go, I landed and he dropped on my knees or whatever it might be. Start having a look at how you fly now. Don't introduce anything new. Don't try to do anything too clever. But take pride in your flying. Dare yourself, if you have the respective high, to pull your brakes down to your carabiners for five seconds and lift them up again. And you'll notice it doesn't burst into flames uh, and nothing bad happens. But be confident. Okay, I can do that. I can do that. As I said before, know where your big ears lines are. And if you have the respective height and opportunity, practice your big ears, practice your speed bar, make your turns really nice. Make the whole thing that you do, make the presentation of what you do under a paraglider look nice. And if you're finding on launch, well, I'm a little little bit scared of this, you know, don't neglect the launch because you're really good when you get in the air and you're really good at landing. So as long as you can bundle yourself off the hill, the rest of it's really good. Don't let that be an acceptable part of your flying. Don't let not really being sure about your kit being an acceptable part. We've spoken about stuff tonight. And if you're not confident doing it, ask a friend. You've got a great club and some great people in your club here. So ask them. Get confident with taking a reserve out and in. Don't let me catch you on the SIV with a reserve system that's non-functionable or elastic bands that have perished or bridles that are completely the long, wrong length or a, or a speed bar that's completely asymmetrical or asking me on the first day orientation flight, Lee, where's my big ears lines, buddy? Or Lee, where's my Stabilo line? Get to know those bits because actually those are the most important parts of what we, what we do. That makes sense. Get familiar with your kit and be confident with it. 